In this video, we will go step by step through a complete hardware design in KiCad 7 for a Bluetooth capable STM32 microcontroller. From project creation through to drawing the schematic and figuring out the circuitry required, laying out and routing the PCB, and finally ordering the boards at PCBWay. The board you are seeing here is something very similar to what we are going to create and features an STM32 WB55 microcontroller, USB Type-C connector for power and data, as well as a TagConnect programming header and a chip antenna. Most of the design we will be creating in this video, given the time constraints, will be nearly identical. However, we will be using a generic UFL antenna connector instead of a chip antenna and won't root out all of the microcontroller's interfaces. I will put relevant links in the description box below, as well as timestamps of all sections of this video. I really hope this video helps you design your own SCM32 Bluetooth capable projects. And if it does, please do leave a like, a comment and subscribe for more hardware design content in the future. A huge thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. The PCBs you saw at the beginning of this video were manufactured and assembled by PCBWay. Those were four layer boards and they included double sided assembly and they did a fantastic job. I'll show you at the end of this video once we finish the design of our own SM32 Bluetooth capable hardware, what the ordering process is like at PCBWay, what files we need to submit and what the usual durations and costs are. So make sure to check out that section near the end of the video. Make sure to go to pcbway.com to check out their services, but also make sure to follow them on Instagram to check out a selection of designs that PCBWay have manufactured and assembled. It has been about a year now since this video on KiCad SM32 PCB design came out, and this was video number 65 on my channel, where we went through a complete SM32 based hardware design, looking at the schematic, PCB design, and how to get this manufactured in just under two hours. This used a pretty basic SM32 F1 microcontroller, USB, some peripherals, and so on. And this video will be another full tutorial, except we are now moving to KiCad 7. So I'd strongly suggest going to the KiCad website and I'll leave links in the description below, getting KiCad 7 and following along. I will assume a tiny bit of prior electronics knowledge and maybe that you've designed one or two PCBs beforehand, but I will show you the entire process from creating the project, creating the schematic, all the way to PCB layout and routing and then how to get this design manufactured. Other than using KiCad 7, what you probably already saw from the title of this video is that we'll be using a Bluetooth capable microcontroller from ST called the STM32WB. The specific part number we're using is this 55CE. I'll leave the specs in the link in the description below. Effectively, it's a very low power dual core ARM Cortex M4 microcontroller. It can run up to 64 megahertz clock speed for one core and 32 megahertz for the other. It has a certain number of flash memory, Bluetooth capable, USB, and so on. And I'll show you the basic circuitry you need to set this up to get this working, how to do the RF Bluetooth connection and all the supporting circuitry. The actual part of mouse that we can see here, it costs about $6 a piece in low quantities. Throughout this video, I'll show you the relevant documents we need that help us design hardware such as this, for example, application notes, data sheets for external components or data sheets for the microcontroller itself. And we'll look at other components we need that we need to add to our design to get this up and running. The board you saw at the beginning of this video used exactly this STM32WB55 microcontroller, except for the RF part, I used a chip antenna, so a very small PCB based antenna. Whereas in this video, for the sake of simplicity, we will be simply using an antenna connector and then you can attach whatever antenna you want to use. Before we continue, please make sure you have KiCad installed and ready. And again, just go to keycad.org and download the latest version for your operating system. What I also strongly suggest you download when this is the tool we'll be using for the pinout and this is the tool you would typically use, for example, to program and write your firmware is called STM32 Cube IDE, which is a free Eclipse based editor, which you can download from st.com. Again, I'll be leaving a link to this in the description box below. Once you have all of that, we're ready to jump to creating our project. We can only scratch the surface in one of these fairly short YouTube videos going through the whole design, but I do have full length courses available via Fedevel, and I'll leave a link to this in the description below. Signing up to courses really supports me, helps the channel and allows me to make this free content. I have a mixed signal hardware design course with KiCad using KiCad 6, but it's applicable to many different eCAD tools, as well as an advanced digital hardware design course 
where you can learn how to design with BGA packages, high-speed systems such as DDR3 memory, FPGA, system on chips, and so on. Again, I'll leave a link to this in the description below, and thank you so much for your support. With KiCad 7 open, what you need to do as a first step is go to File, New Project, and then simply create a new project in whatever folder you want to and give it a name. In KiCad, we have several different steps we need to go through. First of all is of course the project, then we need to create the schematic, so the electrical drawing so to speak, where we place components, we wire them up, add in the peripherals we need and so on, before we can then later move for example to the PCB editor, where we take what was on the schematic and then place the physical components so to speak and wire them up. We'll start with the schematic editor right at the top, so click on that. This will then greet us with a simple blank schematic page. I can of course just move my mouse cursor, but holding for example middle mouse button down and then moving my mouse lets me navigate across the page. I can use the middle mouse wheel to scroll in and out, left click and drag to select, right click opens up for example a properties window. I'll try to include of course the basic commands as we go along, but it does of course require a bit of practice to get familiar with them. In KiCad, the way we add symbols to a schematic is by looking at the right side of the toolbar, this op-amp symbol, add a symbol, we can click on that, and KiCad contains a pretty large library of pre-made components. So this could be from ADCs, connectors, diodes, resistors, and so on. And we'd simply open up one of these dropdowns and select the part we want, click OK and add it into the design. We can also use the filter at the top, for example, if I type in R, it'll immediately jump, for example, to the resistor. I could double click on that, move around on the schematic with my mouse. I can zoom in with my middle mouse wheel and click to place. I can then right click cancel or simply press escape to cancel the command. And now I have a resistor placed on the schematic. The little node with a circle we see here indicates that this component or that end of the component is not connected to anything yet. When I hover over this node with my mouse, you can see this little kind of wand or line appears. If I left click, I can then draw a wire. And again, click, 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 and I can draw an arbitrary shaped wire. Double click to finish the command or escape to cancel if you don't want to draw that wire and Control z of course to undo as usual. You might also have seen on the right hand side, under add a symbol, we also have a shortcut A. So I can just press A on my keyboard, and that brings up the same menu. I could type in for example C, and that puts in a capacitor, like so. To copy a component, I can simply click Control c and then Control v and then Control v as many times as I want, and place loads of different components. Other than, for example, hovering over the nodes, to draw a wire, I can also press W, or go to the wire command on the right hand side, and then I can draw my wire as usual. Other things we need to know are, for example, adding a power symbol. So for example, if you want to add ground or some sort of power net, such as 3.3 volts and so on, you would press P or on the right hand side, click this ground symbol. So if we click on that, we get a different menu, we expand the power sections, we get different predefined power symbols, as well as various different ground symbols as well. So if I can click on a ground, I could, for example, attach that to this resistor, just as a very simple example. Additionally, what we'll be using is add a net label on the right side. We can either press L or click on this button on the right, and this labels our nets. The reason we want to label our nets, and we'll see that on the PCB design later on, is because if we click on this net and then look on the bottom left-hand side, we can see the connection name is net C1 pad 1. Net C1 pad 1 doesn't tell us particularly much. However, if we, for example, give this a net label, so press L or click this button, and then we call it, for example, RC, and this is a very, very crude example, and then we place this net label on our net, cancel the command, and then click on the net again, we can see the connection name has now changed to something maybe more sensible, such as RC. And we'll see this in more detail later on, for example, when we're hooking up USB and so on, we need to use net labels. There are, of course, many, many other commands, and we'll probably explore them, or some of them, as we progress through this video. With the basics out of the way, we can drag and select with our mouse, and press delete on our keyboard, and again, we start with empty schematic. So now we have the basics out of the way. The bit I would like to start with is our STM32WB microcontroller. And in particular, we'll be using the STM32WB55 CEU6. And this happens to be a QFN style package with 48 pins, and you can read more about the specifics in the datasheet, which I'll leave in the links in the description below. So this is the first part I would like us to add to our keycard schematic, because this will form pretty much the centerpiece of the design, and we will be designing around this part as we'll see. This part will require some external circuitry, we might want to add some peripherals, for example, some UART connections or programming interface and so on, so it does make sense to start with our centerpiece for this specific design. 
So going back to keycard, again, we can press A or on the right hand side, go to the toolbar, I'll press A, and then we can look for our microcontroller. So SM32 WB55CEU. And luckily enough, and nicely enough for us, the keycard libraries already include this part. And you can see it's with a little X at the end because there are different variations of this part, but this fits our description quite well. Typically, I'd strongly advise against using third party libraries, especially ones you download off the internet, because they many, many times contain errors, they're not consistent, and it's much better to create your own symbols and footprints, and we'll see how to do that later on as well. But in the case of the keycard libraries, they are pretty decent, so that's why for this, this is okay, and also for the sake of time. So click on this, we can double click, move around, and we'll place this somewhere in the center of our schematic, escape to cancel, and then we can zoom in to look at this part. This is a microcontroller, so it has a lot of many, many generic pins, and these are arranged into banks. For example, PA0, PA123, up to PA15 are signed to pins on the package, the physical package. So PA0 is mapped to pin 9 on the physical package, PA1 to 10, and so on. We also have a second bank, so PB0, which are mapped to different pins. Left-hand side, we have PC, we have PH, P4, and these are generic GPIO, let's call them, and they might have certain constraints which we can get from the datasheet or from other software, which we'll see later on. We also, of course, have power pins because we have to power this active device, and these typically sit at the top of a symbol. So we have VDD, which is digital voltage input, so to speak. We have VBAT if you want to connect this to, for example, a battery source when VDD is disconnected. We have VDDA, which typically references to an analog supply. VDDRF, RF being radio frequency, so we can assume what that is, and some other pins as well, which we'll explore throughout the design. At the bottom, we also have VSS pins, and VSS are typically ground pins or negative supply rail pins. We have VSS, VSSRF, and VSS SMPS or switch mode power supply, and we'll see why we need that later on. Of course, there are many other pins, and this depends on what microcontroller you're using. You might have oscillator input pins, you might have a reset pin, programming interface pins, it depends on the microcontroller. But we'll see, for example, for the STM32 line, how we can find out what we need to connect where, how to choose our pinouts, and so on. On that note, the first place you should pretty much always look is the datasheet. The datasheet will tell you the main aspects of what this microcontroller is capable of, so for example, core frequencies, what the supply voltage rails ranges are, what crystal oscillators they support, what memories they have, what peripherals they have, and so on. So it really makes sense to look through the datasheet, and we could work through the datasheet and then simply carry over that information to our microcontroller design in KiCad. Now, this is of course perfectly fine, but it's a bit tedious because they have other tools available. Other than the datasheet, there are usually application notes or evaluation kits provided by the manufacturer. In the case of the RF line for the st 32 microcontrollers, ST provides an application note, AN5165, titled how to develop RF hardware using st 32 WB microcontrollers. This is the document we will be referring to quite a bit because it provides reference designs and external components we need to get the basics up and running for our st 32 wireless or Bluetooth microcontroller. We can see here that they have a section on reference board schematics, how to choose components, for example, external capacitors, inductors, how they might do layout and routing, and so on. And this is a document in particular for the reference board schematics, if we click on that, we can see they have just the basics already set up for various microcontrollers and different packages. So for example, on page 13, we are also using a part which has a QFPN 48 pin style package. And this is the schematic we will be referring to just to save ourselves quite a bit of time. Of course, we'll look at some rules of thumbs and guidelines and why these components are there. So I wouldn't recommend just blindly copying what you see in a reference design, but understanding why these components are there. And we'll talk through that as we progress through this video. On another note, so other than looking at data sheets and application notes, you should also look at the firmware or software that the manufacturer provides. In this case, this was STM32 QIDE, which we saw near the beginning of this video. I have STM32 Cube IDE open and downloaded, and I'd strongly suggest, if you'd like to follow along, to download this as well and start it up at the moment. In Cube IDE, we can go to the top left, File, New, STM32 Project, and this brings up this MCU selector panel. So they have all the microcontrollers, or pretty much all the microcontrollers ST manufactures, and we can pick one of them and use that for our project. The one we would like to use is of course the STM32 WB55CEU6. So I type this into the commercial part number field at the top and we're presented with two options here. 
and we'll just go with the CEU6 variant, we can immediately see that it's active, so it's still recommended for new designs. We can see the package type, the amount of flash, RAM, IO, call frequency, and so on. So we click on that, click next, give our project a name, and we can click finish for now. What we're using STM32 Cube IDE for is to do basic pinout planning. As we'll see, this is an incredibly useful interface for these types of microcontrollers to do pinout planning. Immediately after project creation, we're presented with this .ioc window or .ioc file, and this is a top-down view of the physical package of our microcontroller. At the top left, we can see if we hover over a pin, this is pin one, then pin two, three, four, five. So they're arranged in this kind of counterclockwise fashion as they are on the actual package itself. We can see this package has 48 pins, and we'll later see that we actually have a 49th one, which is underneath, which is an exposed pad, but more on that later. But we have some pins that are different colors. For example, this VDD is this kind of beigey color, I believe it is. So if you hover over that, we see VDD is power. If we hover over VBAT, that's power. VDDA is power, VDD, and so on. We can see all of these power pins. Other than that, we can also see some other colored pins. So for example, N reset. I don't know, is that yellowish green? That's pin seven. And this tells us maybe this is something to do with reset. And then these 81 pins got a different color, but also these oscillator, so OS out and OS in, as well as the RF pin, RF1 pin, pin 21, also has a different color. So immediately we can see these might have different functions. We might need to pay extra care to those pins. Other than those pins, we also have these kind of light gray pins. So for example, PC14, PB8, PB9, PA0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And these are our GPIO. Moving back to the schematic, just cross-referencing, these are these PA0 to PA15 pins, PB0 to PB9, and so on. And what we also just saw were the VDD, VSS pins, and so on. So in this case, VBAT, VDD, and so on are fixed pins. They are power input, we can't move them around. But for example, PB8, if we left click on it, we can see the different options we have for that pin. So this could be an I squared C clock line, or it could be a simple GPIO input, or it could be a timer channel. If we look at PB1, this has different options. It could be a low power timer, or PA8 at the bottom. This could be a master clock output, or an ADC input, and so on. So in this way, because microcontrollers are so flexible, the pins are multiplex. So one pin can do many, many different functions, but really only one at a time. So this is how we do our pinout planning. We would see what functions do we need? Do we need an ADC? Then we might select this pin and select, okay, we want ADC here. This pin needs to be, I don't know, an SPI clock pin and so on. What we can also do, rather than clicking on individual pins and then figuring it out that way, we could, of course, could go the datasheet route, or on the left-hand side, you probably will have already noticed, we have various categories. So if we go to connectivity, we can see we have two I squared C's available. If I click on one of these I squared C's, open the drop-down, select I squared C, we can see STM32 Cube IDE already maps PB8 and PB9 to I squared C clock and data. If I control click on one of these pins, you can see PB6 now starts to flash. And this is because PB6 can also do I squared C1 SCL, so I could remap it there. And PB9, I could remap it to PB7 or PA10, the flashing pins. Why we would want to do this, this is when we come to the PCB layout and routing stage. If we have flexibility and we're not using all of the pins of the microcontroller, we can simply rearrange, for example, this I squared C to be up here, if this means it's closer to a peripheral or closer to a connector. This is a really nice thing about microcontrollers and FPGAs, is that they are rather flexible, within reason. And we can see this within reason part by using these tools. So for example, if I want to enable USB, I click on USB, enable it as a device, and then the pins are mapped to PA11 and PA12. If I control click on these pins, we can see there's nothing else flashing. And this is quite often the case for maybe higher speed peripherals, such as USB, is that their functions cannot be remapped to different pins. So that internally, it's fixed mapping to PA11 and PA12. The same thing we have at the bottom here at this RF pin. The RF pin is a very, very important pin. As you might have expected, this is the radio frequency or Bluetooth interface to our antenna. And this, of course, can't be remapped either. We now have all of the basics in place to start the schematic properly. We already have our centerpiece, our STM32WB55 microcontroller. We know approximately what these pins are, and now we need to figure a way of how to hook them up, what to connect them to, and so on. Given that this is a somewhat short video and a very condensed video, I won't be making a full board with this, but rather I want to show you how to choose peripherals, how to map them out, and how to connect out the main essential circuitry of this device. First thing I want to do, and this will become a bit clearer later on, is select this part, 
and then press X on my keyboard and that rotates it or mirrors it around the Y axis. Then I can take these labels, click and then drag just to move them into place. We can see we have two labels, so to speak. The bottom is our part number and the top is what's called a reference designator. So this designator needs to be unique to whatever component we have on our schematic. So we might have many different components. We might have a couple different microcontrollers or processors. And we have three microcontrollers. We have U1, U2, U3. We have different resistors. It would be R1, R2, R3, and so on and so forth. They are unique identifiers for components on our PCB and components on our schematic. The part number isn't quite correct either. So I'll double click on that and change the X to CEU6. The first thing I'd like to do is connect my ground pins right at the bottom to ground. So as we saw at the start, we can add a power symbol or press P and I'll add a ground, double click and place it at the ground pins. Now, I personally don't like having the ground label showing. I think it's fairly obvious from the symbol of what this ground is. So I'll double click on this and hide the value. Then I'd like to connect up my ground flag or my ground symbol to the VSS pins, which are the ground pins of our microcontroller. So I can press W and click and root all of these pins up like so. And this means we have now pins 32, 22 and 49 all hooked up together to ground. At the top side of our device, or at least in the schematic, we have all of these power pins. So we have VDD, USB, SMPS, RF, VDDA, VDDs and so on. Now this can be quite confusing knowing what voltages to hook these pins up to. Again, we could either refer to a reference design such as from this application note, and we can see what they're doing for this particular part. They've hooked up VDDs and VBATs all together, but then they have a separate VDD USB, but they're actually connecting VDDA also to 3.3 volts. Another place we could of course look is of course the data sheet, for example, section 3.7, looking at supply management, and this will tell us all about various configurations of our power distribution, what external components we need, and what voltage ranges we have on various pins. So for example, here VDD can be 1.71 to 3.6 volts. VDDA has a different voltage range. VDD USB has this voltage range, and they tell us more about these different pins. To give you a condensed answer, typically VDD pins are what your logic levels are. If you're interfacing your microcontroller to other peripherals that also run off 3.3 volt logic, you would of course want to run VDD, your core or your IO voltage also off the same voltage. VDD therefore typically for microcontrollers will be for example 3.3 volts. For low power designs this might be 1.8 volts, but you can go anywhere in the range that the datasheet allows you to. The VDDA pin, pin 8, is the analog supply pin because of the A at the end. And this is a separate supply to the VDD pin, which is the digital supply, because the VDDA pin feeds, for example, analog to digital converters, or in certain cases DAX, so digital to analog converters. So VDDA pin 8 might need some extra filtering to maybe isolate it a bit more or reduce the noise from the digital supply. VDDRF feeds the RF front end, so this will feed, for example, our Bluetooth front end. VBAT, we can connect to VDD if we're not using a battery or connect to a separate battery source if we are using a battery, for example, if VDD is disconnected. VDD USB powers the USB transceivers within the microcontroller, and this can be a separate supply to VDD. So for example, if VDD is only at 1.8 volts, we saw from the datasheet that VDD USB needs to be 3.0 to 3.6 volts. So for example, we could power VDD USB separately to VDD if we need different voltages. This part is a bit peculiar because we also have this VDD SMPS and SMPS stands for switch mode power supply. These SN32WB microcontrollers have several low power modes and it can generate its own internal voltages and it can generate its own voltages using its own switch mode power supply or switcher. So this will take an input voltage at 34, pin 34, and it has a switch node at pin 33 and it can generate its own voltages. And we'll look at this in detail in just a second. My recommendation, if you haven't done this before, is to just follow the application nodes. So for example, here they've tied everything pretty much to 3.3 volts. Also the VDDA, they've tied without extra filtering directed to 3.3 volts. Also the VDD SMPS, pin 34, they've tied to 3.3 volts. But VDD USB, they've tied to a separate voltage, which seemingly they've tied to a header. What we'll do in our case, we'll follow this, we'll tie everything to 3.3 volts, but also VDD USB to 3.3 volts, meaning the USB transceivers are active all the time. And this is just for simplicity. You of course can change this depending on your power supply scheme requirements, if you need lower power modes, if you don't want the USB transceivers enabled and so on. But 
we will type everything to 3.3 volts for simplicity. What you'll also see is that we have what's known as decoupling capacitors placed next to these pins. So we have these 100 nanofarad capacitors usually, but then we have these larger, for example, 4.7 microfarad capacitors connected up to these pins. And decoupling capacitors, very simply speaking, provide a local energy storage right next to the relevant pins. So this is hard to see on the schematic, but once you come to PCB layout and routing later on, pin 20 will be a physical pin on the device, and we want to place a decoupling capacitor very close to that pin 20. This is so that we have a local energy storage. So when our microcontroller through pin 20 draws a sudden burst of current, this can be supplied directly by our local energy reservoir, very simply speaking, which is a short low inductance connection from C10 or whatever capacitor is close to that pin. So we typically have 100 nanofarad capacitor per pin. So as we can see here, we have 20, 35, 48, and one. So four pins, and therefore we have four individual 100 nanofarad capacitors. Same thing for VDD USB. This has its own local decoupling capacitor. Then we have some exceptions to that rule. Sometimes manufacturers recommend specific values for decoupling capacitors. So example for VDDA, it recommends C17 and C18 to be one microfarad and 10 nanofarads. And for example, the VDD SMPS, 4.7 microfarads and 100 nanofarads. And this should always be taken with a slight pinch of salt. Typically paralleling different types of capacitors is not a good idea and typically also not necessary. So in our case, I would simply place one 100 nanofarad capacitor close to VDDA, and for the switch mode power supply, we do have a requirement that we need quite a large capacitance, and we'll see where that comes from in just a second. But in general, one 100 nanofarad capacitor per power pin is what we want. We also have noticed C6 on the left side here, which is a 4.7 microfarad capacitor, so quite a bit larger than these 100 nanofarad capacitors. And this is what's known as a bulk bypass or bulk decoupling capacitor. And this is a capacitor that should be somewhere close to the device. It's a bit of a larger local energy storage, but doesn't have to be particularly close to any individual pin. It should just be placed close to the package of our microcontroller. Similarly on the reference design, we also see we have VDDRF in the top right corner. And here they also have two parallel capacitors, so one C1 at 100 nanofarads and a C2 at 100 picofarads for the VDD-RF section. Again, paralleling capacitors only really make sense if the package sizes of the components are vastly different. So if we're using a very, very large package, so a very physically large package with this 100 nanofarad capacitor and a comparatively much smaller package for this 100 picofarad capacitor, then okay, it might make sense to place C2 close to pin 23 in a much smaller package, and C1 is then a bit further away, as we'll see later in the PCB design. But for modern packages, and because we'll be using very small packages in this design anyway, we could typically get away with just a 100 nanofarad capacitor placed at pin 23. So in essence, going back to KiCad, what this all boils down to is that we have these power pins at the top, and they all need their own decoupling or bypass capacitors. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have VBAT, three times VDD, VDDA, VDD USB. So they all need 100 nanofarads. And then we have VDD SMPS, which needs a 4.7 microfarad capacitor and VDD RF, which also is tied to 3.3 volts, which also needs 100 nanofarads. The way I would like to then organize my schematics, just to make it easier then for the PCB layout and routing, is to place capacitors where they need to be and also segment them in certain sections. So to me, pin 40, VDD USB, VDDA, the three VDDs and VBAT belong together. VDD SMPS is its own entity and VDD RF is its own entity. So to add a symbol, press A, look for C, or type in C and then we'll select this capacitor. We'll just place one, press escape, double click on the C value and we'll change this to 100 nanofarads. I can then press the wire command, so W to start drawing wires and I'll start with VBAT and I'll just hook up this one section, so VDD USB, VDDA, the three VDDs and VBAT, and this is one section. It's good always to deliver design intent within the schematic already. For example, you have separate PCB layout engineers and schematic or hardware designers to deliver intent. So we have VDD USB, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we need six of these capacitors. I can drag and move, control C, and I want six of these. These six should be hooked up to the connections we just made. And the bottom side of these capacitors should be ground. So we can just copy the ground symbol we had here. So drag, control C, and just place it below the capacitors. And again, just the wire tool with W, hook these up like so. I'd also like to add in a bulk 
capacitor just for these pins. So I can again either just copy these. So I've placed another capacitor. I can change the value to 4U7, which is the same as 4.7 microfarads. So now we have all of these capacitors hooked up to these specific power pins. What I'd like to do is add in 3.3 volt symbol. So I can click on this symbol on the right side, add a power symbol or press P. And then we can look for 3.3 volts. And we'll take this one here, move it to the top of these capacitors, W to change the wire tool. And now we have a 3.3 volts hooked up to these pins. Now we still have to hook up the VDD SMPS and the VDD RF section. So I'll simply take C7 and C1 and create the structure which ties in directly to VDD SMPS. And this is how I would segment my schematics. So this immediately shows me, for example, C8, C9 in this case belong to 34. Now, of course, you could put all these capacitors in just in a single row because they're tied to 3.3 volts on the ground. But this to me compartmentalizes the schematic a tiny bit more. Then we have our VDD RF section, which ties up in our case just to a 100 nanofarad capacitor. Of course, if you want to, you can follow the hardware reference design guide, but I found this 100 picofarads in parallel, as long as the package size is sufficiently small, doesn't matter and doesn't add anything. So that's why we're just using a 100 nanofarad capacitor. And this is how easily we've now hooked up our power and ground to our microcontroller. So very simple, we tied all our grounds to ground and we figured out using the data sheet and reference design guides what the power pins need to be tied to. Keep in mind, this depends on the scenario. If you want to use the switch mode power supply, if you want to do some more filtering on the VDDA pin, if you have an external battery and so on. But for our just USB powered case, this is completely sufficient. Now that we have our power supplies in place, at least most of them, we need to look at the next section of the essentials to get this microcontroller up and running. And these pins happen to live on the right hand side of this symbol. So for example, the other parts of the switch mode power supply, so SMPS, VLX, so pin 33, pin 31, as well as the crystal oscillators, we have to attach to some of these pins, and of course the RF section. Again, referring to the data sheet, for example, section 3.7, we can look at the power supply distribution section and see that this part, as we saw before, contains a switch mode power supply that we can either use or not. It also tells us that the switch mode power supply step down converter improves low power performance with a sufficiently high VDD voltage. As we said before, the switch mode power supply can regulate VDD down to a lower supply voltage again for low power mode, so we would like to use this. So therefore, we can see on the SMPS configuration in the datasheet, we need this inductor L1 connected between VLX and VFB, as well as this C2 capacitor. Luckily enough, table six gives us typical component values, as well as part numbers for these parts. So C2 should normally be 4.7 microfarads, and they give us a suitable part number just in case. And L1 depends on the switching frequency of the switching power supply. So for eight megahertz switching frequency, we need 2.2 microhenries. For four megahertz, we need 10 microhenries. What is also not actually shown in the top picture, but only shown as a footnote in footnote two, we need two series inductors. So we need L1A and L1B, very simply speaking. We need an extra 10 nanohenry inductor. Again, they're giving a part number and series with L1 to apparently improve the receiver performance. It turns out for L1, at least our main bulk inductor, let's call it, we are running actually at four megahertz switching frequency. And that's why we need this larger 10 microhenry inductor. And then we can see the footnote four, we would choose, for example, a Murata part titled as so. And we could, of course, also just take this information from the application node where we see the VLX, VFB pins. We have this 10 nanohenry series inductor, 10 microhenry bulk inductor, let's call it, and our nominally 4.7 microfarad capacitor. And this is how we need to hook it up. Remember, we already hooked up VDD SMPS with our bulk and 100 nanofarad capacitor to 3.3 volts. So that's our power supply input. And we hooked up the VSS switch mode power supply pin to ground. So now with this information taken from the data sheet, taken from the application notes, we can add this into our schematic. Unfortunately, the KiCad schematic part isn't particularly great because it splits up VLX and VFB between these oscillator pins. So this could become maybe a tiny bit messy. In any case, we want to add a part. So what we do is as usual, press A, and we want to add an inductor. So I'll type in L, and this will jump immediately to inductor. I can press R to rotate the component on my keyboard. So we want one inductor here, copy that, and we want another 
inductor. Remember we want the 10 nanohenries and the 10 microhenries. And then we want our output capacitor. So I'm just gonna press escape to cancel. And I'm gonna copy one of these 4.7 microfarad capacitors at the output, the wire tool, or just click on the nodes to join these components up. And remember VFB SMPS needs to connect to the output after the inductor. So that you could either draw this in here, but technically it should be taken at the output after the capacitor. And this just shows a bit of design intent, but for the sake of simplicity and keeping the schematic a bit neater, I'm just gonna move the connection like so. Remember, the other side of this capacitor needs to connect to ground, so I'll just copy a ground symbol, place it, and hook it up. Now let's type in the component values. So for L1, we want the 10 nanohenry inductor first, as taken from the application node, and the 10 microhenry inductor afterwards. Remember we talked earlier also about net labels, and this is the first place where we'll add some net labels. Without net labels, if we just click on, for example, this Y segment here, looking at the bottom left, we see net U1 VLX SMPS, which as itself is an okay net name. It kind of tells us what it is, but we could just simplify that by adding a net label. So pre either press L on the right-hand side, add net label, and I'll just call this SMPS LX and place it on the net. And then I just want to make it smaller. I'll make this text size to, for example, 0 0.5. And this way, now we have switch mode power supply LX. This tells us it's the switch mode power supply and it's the switch node. I can copy this net label, put it over here, and keep in mind, this might not be the greatest of net names, but SMPL LXL is the junction of our inductors. And then we copy this net label again, put it down here, and this is effectively the feedback SMPS. So that's what I'll label it like so. And this might not seem particularly important now in the schematic, but it does help us quite a bit when we come to the PCB design because we instantly see, without having to jump back to the schematic, that this net is the feedback or the output of our switch node. This is the feedback pin, and this is the switch node pin, for example. So now we've moved over all of the power as well as the switch mode power supply section of the microcontroller. To get this part up and running before we can, for example, interface with GPIO, various interfaces such as UART, I2C, and so on, we of course want to use Bluetooth functionality, so we'll have to hook up pin 21, which is this RF1 pin, and this needs to be hooked up to a matching network, antenna, and so on, and we'll get more to that in just a second. But also, we need a programming interface, and this could be a JTAG, it could be serial wire debug, but we also need crystal oscillators. Now, this part does have oscillators, but for timing and also for low power modes, we need to attach both a high-speed external crystal, so to pins 25 and 24, this will be a 32 megahertz crystal, but also to pins two and three, this will actually be a low speed external crystal or LSE for short. This needs to be a 32.768 kilohertz crystal. So let's attach those next. We can get the required crystal parameters again, looking at the data sheet. So for example, section 6.3.10, looking at external clock source characteristics. So again, we have the high speed external, which is a 32 megahertz crystal oscillator, or of course you can supply just from a CMOS oscillator and needs to be in the range of six to eight picofarads of load capacitance. Similarly, for the low speed external crystal, this needs to be a 32.768 crystal resonator. We can see how these crystals might typically be attached. For example, for the LSE, the low speed external, we'd have the pins on the microcontroller and internally it has an amplifier and driver. Externally, we have the crystal resonator and sometimes these crystals include the load capacitors and sometimes we'll have to place these external load capacitors around the crystal as well. For the high speed external crystal, which is fairly unique to this specific part, we can see the datasheet says the device includes internal programmable capacitances that can be used to tune the crystal frequency. So the nice thing is for the high speed external part, we actually don't need to supply external load capacitances around the crystal. Now I know I'm just skimming over crystal oscillator design for microcontrollers, but ST actually does have an application note. This is application note AN2867, and I'd strongly suggest you read through this or at least skim through this before you continue. This tells you why you need a crystal oscillator, why we need load capacitances to get these working and how to tune the frequency and how to compute the value of these load capacitances, such as these formulas here and how to estimate, for example, stray capacitances how to calculate external resistances, and so on. I know it's fairly lengthy at about 60 pages, but it's well worth a read because a lot of MCUs and a lot of scenarios might require the use of an external crystal.
Also going back to STM32 Cube IDE, we can see those oscillator pins on our configuration window. So in the bottom right, we can see oscillator in, pin 25, oscillator out, pin 24. If we go to system core on the left-hand side, click on RCC, and then high-speed clock, crystal ceramic resonator, those pins are then enabled. So this is the high-speed external crystal, and the low-speed clock, or so the LSE, low-speed external, will select a crystal ceramic resonator, and we can see those are pins PC14 and PC15. So these are the pins that we need to hook up our crystal oscillators to. And just as a little preview, you might have already noticed the clock configuration tab at the top here. If I click on that, we can see on the left-hand side, we have our crystal oscillator input frequencies. So at the top, we have the LSE at 32.768, and this is a fixed frequency. And for the HSE, this can actually seemingly be a variable frequency, anywhere from 4 to 48, with 32 megahertz as the recommended HSE. And internally to the microcontroller, there are various PLLs, so phase locked loops, and this lets you step up and down the frequencies to then clock, for example, the cores or the various peripherals in the device. But it's important that we do supply a, a low speed external and a high speed external crystal at the pins we just saw. So back in KiCad, remember pin 25, pin 24 is for the high speed external, pin 2 and pin 3, or PC14, PC15, is for the low speed external. Again, in KiCad A to add part, I'm just gonna type in crystal, and we have many different choices. So we have just a two pin crystal, we have a three pin crystal with pin two on ground, there's a four pin crystal with pins two and four on ground, and so on. Typically, high speed external crystals, so in the megahertz range, typically come in these crystal ground two, four packages. We have one and three are the main crystal terminals, and pin and two and four are effectively connected to the case, which are grounded. So the high speed external will use this schematic symbol, and we'll press A again. And for the 32.768 crystal, we will actually use the two pin crystal symbol because the low speed external crystals typically come in this kind of configuration. So I'll choose this symbol here, like so. I typically also give my crystals not the identifier Y, but the identifier X. So I'll call this X1, and I'll give this the designator X2. We can immediately, instead of having crystal, I'll type in the actual frequency. So that's 32.768 kilohertz, and our high-speed external was 32 megahertz. And then I can drag just to clean up these parts of the schematic already. Now again, unfortunately, this schematic symbol, the keycard default one, isn't particularly great because now we have to have a bit of a messy schematic to route, for example, pins 25 and 24 to the high-speed external, and PC14, PC15 is somewhat okay. So PC14, PC15 is the low-speed external. Sometimes the crystal itself can include the load capacitors, but in the case it doesn't, and we want to design maybe for most use cases, we'll add in the load capacitances externally. So I'll place a capacitor, so I'll press A, type in C, place a capacitor, and we'll place in two load capacitors around our device. So maybe something like so, just cleaning these up just a tiny bit, keep in mind this is fairly crude, W to draw a wire, and this is how we then hook up our crystal, so to the load capacitors, and then the crystal in between, so to speak. The other side of the load capacitors will hook up to ground, so I'll copy a ground symbol, W for wire, and there we go. Now we have PC14, PC15 hooked up to an external crystal oscillator. This is our low speed external to load capacitors. And the values of these will leave as not defined for now, because we'll do that later when we choose the actual part. Because these load capacitances, again referring back to the application node by ST, depend on the type of crystal we choose. Nicely enough, for the high speed external, so this 32 megahertz crystal oscillator, the load capacitors are actually effectively inside the MCU, and these are tunable. So we don't actually have to supply external crystal load capacitors for the high speed external. We simply just have to root it out. And again, I apologize for this symbol, which is the keycard default, but it makes me root past all these sections, and I don't really like the look of this, so I apologize, like so, and oscillator in, maybe something like so. Then, of course, we have pins two and four, so effectively connected to the casing of the crystal. I want to ground those, so I'll copy a ground symbol, W for my wire, and connect pins two and four, like so. And again, you can clean up the schematic as much as you want. You always want to keep it legible if you can, so spacing things out, keeping things connected via wires if you can, and then, of course, adding net labels. I'll just copy a net label, Control c Control v double-click, and then I'll just call it HSE underscore in and HSE underscore out. 
Now, keep in mind, in this configuration, we haven't added any series resistors. And series resistors, for example, looking at the ST application node, AN2867, page 21, typically we would want to add this RX, so an external resistor, a series resistor, which is the output of the amplifier internal to the microcontroller, which feeds the external crystal oscillator circuitry. The reason we would want to place our X is to limit the drive strength to the crystal so we don't distort the crystal, which could reduce its lifespan. But also, our X in combination with the capacitance that follows forms a low pass filter, and that can filter out some of the higher frequency harmonics in case of distortion. I would typically always advise to place a series external resistor, even if just a zero ohm resistor to start with, because you can increase the longevity of your product and you might need to tune this value in any case. Please refer to application node 2867 to figure out how to calculate the value of the resistor. This depends on the drive strength of the amplifier, the crystal you've chosen and so on. But for the sake of simplicity and because it does in many cases work without this and for this very simple video, we'll leave it without, but please do keep this in mind. Back to the net labels, HSE in, I'm gonna copy here and this is of course our low speed external and our low speed external. And there we go, now we've done all of our net labels, we've hooked up our crystal oscillators. Keep in mind the structure and the flow of KiCad is that we simply define component values yet, but we actually haven't assigned specific footprints, so sizes of these components, and we haven't assigned specific part numbers. In KiCad, the flow is a bit odd in my opinion, but this is just the way we'll do it for now. We're getting close to having the main structures in place that allow this microcontroller at least to boot up. Of course, you still need a power source, USB connection, and so on. But the main external circuitry for this microcontroller is getting close to be done. Importantly now, we would like to look at this RF section. And this is quite a bit more involved, especially if you haven't seen this kind of stuff before. So pin 21, RF1, which is eventually effectively an RF IO port for Bluetooth in this case. RF design can seem a bit intimidating to start with, but luckily manufacturers such as ST make this process very simple and tell us pretty much exactly what to do. And again, for this, we refer to AN5165, the RF hardware application node for STM32WB microcontrollers. The RF section, we have a ground pin, so pin 22. We have the VDDRF, which you already looked at before, and we have pin 21, which is the next step we want to look at now. Very simply speaking, and of course I'm just glossing over the details at the moment, RF1, that pin, has a particular impedance that needs to be matched to whatever we're connecting it to. If this is an SMA or a UFL connector, or some antenna, a chip antenna, PCB antenna and so on, we need to match those impedances. Otherwise we don't get maximum power transfer, we get less signal strength, and it might not even work at all. So following from the RF1 pin, we need to do an impedance matching network, and this is something shown here. So this is a pi impedance matching network consisting of a capacitor, inductor, capacitor. This then matches this RF1 pin to a 50 ohm characteristic impedance that we might see, for example, at an antenna. What we also need in the case of these SM32WB microcontrollers is following the matching network, we need a low pass filter. And they are recommending a specific low pass filter here, which is specific for these 2.4 gigahertz Bluetooth frequencies. And this is to reduce the out of band interference and again, taken from this application node. So we have the RF1 pin, we have this Pi matching filter made up of discrete components, then this low pass filter. And then in our case, we will place a UFL, so a very small antenna connector. You could of course go with SMA or trace antenna or chip antenna. For most flexibility and because of the size, I will go with a UFL connector. And here, this is what a UFL connector typically looks like. There's these very small RF sockets and they're also rather cheap. The low pass filter ST recommends is this TDK part. If we look at the data sheet, it's a low pass filter for the frequency band two and a half to 2.5 gigahertz. It's a rather small package, 1.6 millimeters by 0.8 millimeters, four pins, so it has effectively ground and I.O. And this is something we need to create our own symbol and footprint for. But let's start off with adding in this matching network. Luckily for us, they also give us immediately the component or the manufacturer part numbers. So we need a 0.8 picofarad capacitor, 2.7 nanohenry inductor, and a 0.3 picofarad capacitor. So let's add that in. Going back to KiCad, let's add in a capacitor. So again, A and then C, I'll add in a capacitor, add in an inductor for A and then L, R to rotate, 
You can of course just do this by copying components as well, whatever is easiest. Component values we take from the application node, so 0 0.8, 2.7, 0.3, .3. and you can see instead of doing dots, what you've probably already noticed is that I do, for example, nano or pico first, so I do 0, pico, 8. And this to me is far easier to read. Dots are oftentimes very hard to read. So that's why I do this kind of designation. So from our RF1 port, we simply take a wire and feed that in to our capacitor inductor and the output capacitor inductor. This is our matching network. Of course, we still need a ground connection, for example, like so. And this then needs to feed into this low pass filter. So over RF pin feeds into our matching network feeds into our low pass filter, then feeds into our antenna or antenna connector. So now we need to move over to create our own schematic symbol and PCB footprint. Because if we go to A, add components, we can see we don't actually have this DLF low pass filter as part of the symbol library, and there's no alternative as we can see so far. So we have to create our own schematic symbol and footprint. First, let's start off with creating a schematic symbol for this part. To do that, all we need is pretty much the data sheet. Now, data sheets will always vary. Sometimes data sheets will not contain all the information you need, but typically they will. So for this TDK part, you can go to the TDK directly, or I typically always go to Mouser because they have the data sheet immediately linked. And then you can open the data sheet, a PDF document usually, and scroll down. And in this case, we already have pretty much all we need on the second page to create both the schematic symbol as well as the footprint. What we need for the schematic symbol are simply the number of pins we have. So in this case, we have four, one, two, three, four, as well as the pin functions. In this case, it's very, very easy because this is a passive device. We have two input output terminals, one and three, and then we have two ground terminals, two and four. And that's what we need to transfer over to our schematic symbol. In KeyCard, what we can do is go to Tools, Symbol Editor. Unfortunately, the library that come with KeyCAD. So for example, if you go to RF filter, right click, and then new symbol, we can see the library is actually not writable. So we have to create our own symbol library in this case. And this is typically a good idea. If you're, for example, working in KeyCAD on predominantly in KeyCAD, or whatever ECAD tool you're using is to have your own schematic symbol and footprint libraries. So we'll go to file, new library, We'll just make this a project library just for now. I'll just call this library as the project name and then underscore schematic symbols, click save. And now we have a new library entry in the symbol editor. So I can either click at the top left here, create new symbol, or of course, right click new symbol. The symbol name is the name of the part. So I'll just copy the manufacturer number, go back to KeyCAD symbol name. We won't derive this from an existing symbol and the reference designator, this could be U for example, for active ICs, it could be R for resistors, L for inductors and so on. For a filter, we might do FLT for filt. Number of units per package is simply one and we can just simply press OK. What we need to do now is add pins. We can either do that at the top with this pin table where we can bulk edit, or we can on the right hand side, click P or add a pin, and this lets us define pins like so. I'll go the bulk method, so at the top, click on the table, and I'll add in four pins, number one, two, three, and four, and then we go to the data sheet to look at the names. So one was in, two ground, three out, four ground. In, ground, out, ground. Then we have the electrical type, and this is useful for the electrical rules check and for sanity checks. So ground, you could just define this, for example, as a power, as a passive or a power pin. We'll just go for passive and now. And the in, you could of course specify as an input, but this is actually a bidirectional filter. So this could be a bidirectional or we'll just keep it passive for now. But make sure to specify this, for example, for a microcontroller, if we have a VDD pin, this would be a power input, or if we have a, just a, an output pin, then we select a power output and so on. We can select an orientation. So for example, input would be left, ground down, output right, ground down. And if we just click OK, we can drag our pins, press R to rotate and just align them properly. So we typically want inputs on the left, outputs on the right, and grounds, for example, at the bottom, and I'll just do it in the right pin order. Now we would, of course, like a bounding box, for example, as well. well this will be just a very basic symbol. So on the right-hand side, right-hand side, I can add a rectangle, and we could, for example, draw in a rectangle like so. And you could, of course, make it as neat as you wanted to. So something like this might be okay, just as a very, very basic symbol. We can also change the box outline color to make it more in line with KeyCAD. So double click and fill style, fill with body background color. And this looks more KeyCAD-ish, let's call it. 
Now, oftentimes I'd like to add a bit more description inside this part. So on the right hand side, I can click add text item and then you can add a text in. For example, I could say this is a 2.4 to 3.5 gigahertz low pass filter, for example, just as a very, very basic example. But pretty much everything here is just taken from the data sheet so that it's a low pass filter, the frequency range, so to speak, and the pin out function. So one in, two ground, three out, four ground is simply what we've created here. So in one, two ground, four ground, three out, and we can save that. If we go in KiCad in the symbol editor at the top, you can see this symbol property dialog button. If we click on that, we can see the reference will totally be filled. We can add in a value. And for this, I usually put in the symbol name as well. We can add links to data sheets and so on. And this definitely makes sense to fill in for your own libraries. For the sake of time, we will leave this blank for now. What we need to do is now create a footprint that we can then link with this part. So now we've created the schematic symbol, which lives on the schematic, but we also need a physical part, the footprint, which then looks like the shape we see here with these pads of these certain dimensions. And we need to create that and link that to the schematic symbol. Back in the schematic editor, just as we use the create, delete and edit symbol button, two to the right, we can click on this icon of the top toolbar, which is create, delete and edit footprints. So that's exactly what we're going to do. As before, we can browse through the various footprints we see here. For these example of footprints, we have various pads, various dimensions, silk screen layers and so on. And this will become more clear what they are when we move over to PCB design. But as before, we need to create a new library. So go to file, new library. We'll do this a project library and I'll just give this a somewhat sensible name, click save. And on the left hand side, we now see the libraries has a new entry with our own footprint library. We can right click and create a new footprint. This footprint name, again, we take from the data sheet. So for fairly generic components, we could create, for example, a generic footprint that is called UFQFBN48, and that would fit all ICs that are in that package. Or for a resistor, we might have 0402 or 0603 footprints, and those are fairly generic. For something like this filter, there could, of course, be filters that have very similar packages, and then we would create a generic footprint for these types of packages. We can see the package case here doesn't have a specific name. It only gives us the dimensions, so to speak. The data sheet also doesn't tell us a specific package name, unfortunately. For the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to call the footprint the same as the part number itself because we don't have a distinct footprint name for this. And the footprint type is an SMD because this is just a surface mount device and click OK. And now we have a new empty footprint or blank footprint in our footprint editor. What we need to do is then take over these pad dimensions. So there's a recommended land pattern. That's another way of saying recommended footprint. These pads then map to the terminal functions like so. And keep in mind, data sheets often have this third angle projection to so have top, side, and bottom view. So this image, same as the recommended land pattern, is actually viewed from the bottom side. So this is pin one, pin two, pin four, pin three, but this is from the bottom side. So actually from the top side, pin one is on the left, pin four is on the top, pin two is on the bottom, and pin three is on the right hand side. For us, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. It's a bi-directional device. Pin one and three are input outputs, pin two and four are our grounds. So all we have to do is then create this land pattern, these SMD patterns and pads based on these dimensions. So for example, with these elongated pads, we have 0.275 millimeters width, 0.7 millimeters height. So in KiCad, going to the top copper layer, on the right hand side, I can click on this circular looking icon, add a pad, and I'll just place the pad somewhere, escape to cancel, zoom in and double click to edit the properties. What we need to change is the pad number. So that's one, two, three or four. In this particular case, we need to change the pad position, the pad shape, as well as the pad size. So the pad size is the easiest. So the X was this 0 0.275. So let me type that in 0 0.275 and our height from the data sheet was 0 0.7. And this is taken from the recommended land pattern, 0 0.7. Typically, it's suggested also by IPC to keep your pad shapes, if they are suggested as square, make them as rounded rectangle. And this provides better gasketing when applying the solder paste via a stencil, for example. You could, of course, just go with rectangular. But I make my footprints pretty much always with rounded rectangle and a corner radius about 25% if it's just a normal pad. Then we have the X and Y positions. And this unfortunately can be a bit more involved because data sheets don't clearly give you that information. You'll pretty much always have to calculate that yourself based on the dimensions they give you. For example, here, 
assuming the center is directly in the center of the part, so the y and x axes on the center of the part, they only give us the dimensions, so the spacing between the pads, for example here, or the spacing vertically between the pads, and we have to figure out the centers of these pads ourselves. So for example, the center of the upper and lower pads are given from the center origin are 0.21 plus the height of one of those pads, so it's 0.245 divided by two. Similarly, the X centers of the left and right pads are half the one of these pad widths plus a whole distance between the left pad and the center pad, so 0.25 plus half of this distance. So it's 0.45 divided by two, plus 0.25 plus 0.275 divided by two. So that turns out to be about 0.613. So that's what we type in the position X is what we just calculated. And again, you won't be able to get this precision also with manufacturing to all these four decimal places. So it might make sense to round down, for example, to minus 0.61 or to minus 0.613 rather than having four significant figures. But we'll just leave it for now for the sake of simplicity, then press OK. And now we have this tiny pad added here. We can copy that pad, add it again, and simply type in 0.6125. And this is the right pad, which is pad three. So we'll change the pad number, press OK. And then we need the two central pads, so pads two and four, which are our ground pads. So again, we can just copy this, edit it, pad number two, which will be the bottom one. Remember, this is the bottom view, so it's flipped. Then again, for this, it doesn't really matter because two and four are ground pads. And then we need to define the dimensions, which are 0.25 for the height and 0.45 for the width. So 0.45 and 0.245. And the X position is zero because it's aligned with a center. And the Y position is a half of 0.21 plus a half of our pad height, which is 0.25. And that's 0.2275 and press OK. There we go. Now we have one, two and three. We'll copy this pad and then this is minus 0.2275. Pad dimensions are the same. Pad number is four and this is minus 0.2275. Press OK. This should hopefully be our footprint. Now, this is done very quickly. So remember to check your footprints very thoroughly and the pad positions. This is incredibly important. Otherwise, this component will not be able to be assembled properly. So other than just having the pads in copper, and we can see this in 3D by going to view, 3D viewer, here's what this would look like on the PCB. We have exposed copper, our exposed pads, as we've drawn them in and sized them just now, taken from the data sheet. What we'd also like to do is maybe draw a bounding box in terms of a silk screen or some sort of courtyard and do pin one indications as well as add in a 3D model. What I'd like to do now is first of all add a 3D model. I think it's incredibly important to always add 3D models to any footprint you are using for mechanical checks, for sanity checks. 3D models can sometimes be hard to find. For example, if we go to the TDK product center, I've looked for this part number and there are various documents such as the data sheet, technical information, and so on. But there seemingly isn't a 3D step file or model that we would need to import that into KiCad, which is unfortunate. And I wish more manufacturers and vendors would provide 3D models because it's such a useful tool. And oftentimes they do, of course, but in this case, we need to find a different way of finding a 3D model. So what I would typically do is type in the part number and then type in step at the end, and then we can find 3D models or 3D step files. So there are sites, for example, Ultra Librarian, that have, for example, footprints and symbols and step models already available. But if you, for example, look at the symbol on the left-hand side, we can see this has been automatically generated and we have pretty bad placement of the symbol pins. So ground is on the left, but also on the right at the top. And the footprint we would have to verify and check ourselves anyway. That's why I'd strongly suggest creating your own schematic symbols and footprints, checking them thoroughly, staying within your own standards. But if you can find an external 3D model or of course create your own, preferably find a model created by the vendor or the manufacturer rather themselves. In this case, Ultra Librarian seems to have a 3D model. Now this doesn't look entirely accurate. If you look at the 3D model here, we can see these pads extend out. It doesn't look entirely right compared to, for example, the manufacturer website but it might be a good starting point and it might be somewhat of a close sanity check if it fits, for example, our footprint, at least dimensionality wise. But I would suggest creating your own or finding a somewhat accurate model, of course, verifying everything as you go. I've downloaded this model. I've added it here into the project folder, this step file. In KiCad, we can go back to the footprint at the top side, click on edit footprint properties, go to 3D models in the top tab, click the plus, and then open the step file. 
Now you can play around with rotations and offsets if it's not correctly aligned, but this looks like it's aligned on our pads. And again, this isn't an entirely accurate 3D model, so you'd have to verify the 3D model, but it's always good to include one after it's been checked on to your footprint as well. You can also, of course, change the opacity and various other parameters, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll leave it as it is for now and click OK. Now, other than having the exposed copper, or if you have through-hole pads and so on, we have various other layers in our PCB design that we'll become more familiar with later on when we actually come to the PCB design. Right now, we're just creating the footprint so we can link it to the schematic symbol. We have other layers other than copper. We also have, for example, mask layers, silkscreen layers, paste layers, and so on. What is oftentimes helpful and what you should do is put a pin one indication. Now, even though this might be a bi-directional part, we also have a pin one. And also from the manufacturer website, we can see there's a pin one marking on the top of this device. So this is what we like to indicate either on a drawing layer or on the silk screen, which is the text such as this white text you would see printed on a PCB. The way you can do that is switch the silk screen layer on the right hand side. I've selected it with this arrow. I can click draw a circle change my grid at the top, maybe to something smaller, and just click once and draw out a circle, escape to finish, double click on the circle, and I can change the line width, radius, and so on. So for example, I can place this pin one indicator circle next to pin one pad. So in the 3D viewer, Alt 3 or View 3D viewer, we now have this pin one indication next to pin one. What we can of course do, and what is sometimes helpful, is also draw an outline on the silkscreen layer. So select silkscreen, then draw the line, line tool and we could for example draw an outline and we could for example draw an outline around the part again this is very crude but it gives an indication for placement of this part so for example we could leave it as something like this please take this with a slight pinch of salt this is just a very simple basic example Control s to save and we've now created our footprint so we can close this window we return back to our schematic symbol editor click again on the display symbol properties and now we can finally assign the footprint. So I'll click on the footprint, or I'll navigate to our new library, select the footprint we created, double click, and now it's assigned directly to our schematic symbol. Click OK. Save the library, and we can close that window. Now, with all of that work in place, we've created our own schematic symbol, we've created our own PCB footprint, and now we can finally get back to our schematic. Now, after all of that work of creating our own schematic symbol and footprint, we can finally add in the low pass filter after the RF matching network. Let's just briefly remind ourselves, remember we had pin RF1 of the microcontroller, which was our RF Bluetooth interface, so to speak. Then we had this 50 ohm matching network, this Pi filter, and now we have this low pass filter. After that, we'll connect this to our UFL connector, which is effectively our antenna connection. And this DLF part is the one we just created. So back in KiCad, we can now press A or add component and we'll look for our DLF 16. And as we should expect, we have our own schematic symbol library and our part, which shows the schematic symbol as well as the footprint. So click OK. And we just attach that simply to the end of our matching network. We have to copy one ground and then we can hook up ground as well. Again, using the wire command. And now we have our low pass filter in place. Finally then, we need to connect our connector. So what we could do is again press A and we could look for various connectors. So there's these various symbols which are available, pin socket, coaxial, but then there's also these connectors called coaxial connectors which most resemble, for example, a UFL or an SMA connector. So I'll go with this con underscore coaxial, double click, place it next to our low pass filter, the wire tool to hook things up, copy the ground, and here we go. Then we have the RF pin from a microcontroller, matching network, low pass filter, coaxial connector. Now keep in mind, this is the bare bone circuit. You might want to add in protection at any connector. You typically want to add protection. You could use different matching network structures depending what type of antenna you use. This is the most basic form. So keep in mind when you're designing for a different system. Now, of course, you want to add net labels again, for example, the RF port here. Then we have, for example, the output of our matching network. And finally, of course, we have our antenna connection over here. The way I'm labeling my nets is that they are somewhat sensibly named. So for example, the RF section, I'm starting everything with RF, the switch mode, power supply, everything with SMPS and so on. This will help when creating net classes, which we'll see later on, as well as in the PCB design. So here we go. This seems like a good first structure of this part of the schematic. 
What we need to do next is make sure that we have some programming interface available for this microcontroller. Now there's different ways of programming the microcontroller. One might be that you use the STM32's internal bootloader to program this device via, for example, UART or USB. But the preferred method and the one I'd suggest is going via JTAG or serial wire debug. Now, of course, there's application notes and many guides on the internet on how to do this. For example, ST's AN40989, how to debug, for example, STM32 microcontrollers. And this tells you about serial wire debug, how to use a debugger, what parts to connect, and what debuggers are useful for. To go into more detail, I do have a number of videos on my channel that tell you about serial wire debug using the debug probe through this ST-Link and Cube IDE to program and configure custom hardware. I'll leave those links in the description below. And of course, I also have a video on USB device firmware upgrade or DFU, how to program your devices via USB. Searching for bootloader in the STM32WB55 datasheet, we can see section 3.5 tell us about the boot modes and firmware update. We can see that we can update the code again via serial wire debug and JTAG, which again should be the preferred method, but also via USB, UART, I2C, or SPI. This also hints at, at the top, we can see the boot zero pin and boot one option bit can be used to select various boot modes. And for us, what's important is the boot zero pin, which you might have already seen before. The boot zero pin is a tiny bit hidden. If we hover over PH3, pin four of our particular microcontroller, we can see PH3 also is called boot zero. And this pin is particularly important and this needs to be tied to either low or high voltage at startup. If we tie boot zero pin low, effectively tying this pin low, boot zero low, at startup, the device, this microcontroller will jump straight into application code and you won't be able to use, for example, bootloader to flash programs via USB or I2C or UART. If, however, at startup, this boot zero pin is pulled high, then the bootloader will initialize and we can program this particular microcontroller, for example, via USB, UART, and so on. So we should keep this in mind and make boot zero a variable or switchable pin. Serial wire debug in any case is accessible as long as you've enabled it as a peripheral. With serial wire debug, we need to break out a couple of pins which are then connected, for example, to an ST-Link, which is ST's version of a debugger. This debugger then connects to your board via the serial wire debug pins, power and ground, and to the other side via USB to your host computer, which you can then use to set breakpoints, program your code, debug your code, and so on. So we really, really want to expose these pins in every design, at least every design I've seen so far. So let's see how to do that. In Cube IDE, we can go to Sys on the left-hand side and then debug. Here we can see the various debug options we have. So serial wire debug, so SWD for short, we have JTAG and trace asynchronous. If we just enable serial wire, we can see two pins have been added. PA13 is serial wire data and PA14 is serial wire clock. So just with two pins, this is enough to have a debugger interface with this device, simply speaking. If we change this to trace asynchronous, we add another pin, and this is the trace output or SWO output. So this is an optional pin, but I'd strongly suggest if you have the space to break out this pin as well, because the trace output can be very useful for monitoring variables and so on. So this is the option we'll select. You can of course use JTAG as well, but I'd strongly suggest if your device supports it, go with trace serial wire debug. So we have PA13, PA14, and PB3. Along with the serial wire debug interface, we also have this N reset pin. This N reset pin, N just stands for inverted logic. So when this pin is pulled low, the STM32 is put into a reset state. When this pin is pulled high, this STM32 microcontroller is pulled out of reset and starts running, so to speak. And this pin is typically also connected up to an ST-Link or to your debugger. So we need N reset, we need our trace pin, PB3, we need our clock, PA14 and PA13, our data IO. And this will hook up to a debugger. Now there's many different ways on different cables, as you can see here, every different image seems to have a different way of interfacing to a debugger. And this is maybe a start of a problem, let's very simply call it, because there's many different ways of interfacing. So you could either put a header onto your board, for example, a header like the one you see here, this ribbon connect cable is connecting to, but my preferred method is using tag connect cables. Tag connect cables or headers connect on one end to your debugger and on the other end they have these pogo pins. These are effectively spring loaded pins and we can see this picture here. So we don't actually have to mount any header on our PCB 
So we save cost for every PCB and we can simply plug in this header, which goes to our debugger. So all we have to have on the PCB is a couple of through holes and a couple of exposed pads. And this is where our serial wire debug connections go into and between our microcontroller and this connector. I'll leave a link to Tag Connect in the description below and also to the ST line of products and which are compatible for the ST link and where to order these parts. In any case, let's remind ourselves of the pins that we need to expose. So PB3, PA14, PA13, and N reset. And we like to connect these to this Tag Connect header in the case of this board. So going back to KeyCAD, it was PB3, so I'll just draw a wire here just to help us remind ourselves, PA14 and PA13. And then of course we have N reset at the top here, on the top right. If I press A, I can add a component as usual and I'll look for TC2030. And this is the connector we just looked at from Tag Connect. And effectively it's the end on our PCB that can interface with this pogo pin header. That pogo pin header goes via an adapter to our ST link. So we just want to place the pads on our PCB. So while this is a component, it's actually not a component that's on the bill of materials. These are simply through holes and they are simply pads. There are two versions. There's the one with legs, which easily clips onto the board. And there's one without legs, which saves a bit more space, but it does require an additional retainer clip. That's why we'll go with a TC2030. We can add that in and put it somewhere to the left-hand side of the board. Nicely enough, the keycat symbol already contains the correct pinout for this TC2030, so we need to connect VCC and ground. VCC is whatever logic voltage you're using for your microcontroller. In our case, this is of course 3.3 volts. We have the end reset signal, which needs to go to, you guessed it, end reset. We have serial wire clock, serial wire data, and serial wire trace. Serial wire trace was PB3, serial wire data was PA13, and serial wire clock was PA14. So as you see here, PA14 clock, PA13 data, SWO PB3. Then ground and power. Then of course we have our reset, but we could of course draw a wire that kind of jumpers over like so, but I find that a bit messy, unfortunately. So what we'll do, we'll just do extend this wire out a bit to just make it obvious that we're doing a jump, add a net label, we'll call this SWD and reset. I can change the orientation by double clicking, changing orientation. And this is just now indicative that this is a jump. So I can control C and hook it up to my reset like so. And this is kind of an indication that this jumps. We also want to add net labels to PA13, PA14 and PB3. For example, something like so. So we have PA13 is data IO. And again, this is just helpful for the PCB design aspect as well and trace. Of course, you can increase the font sizes and so on, depending on your preferences. Now for the serial wire debug header or any connector, any exposed interface, you typically should add ESD protection to make sure when you're messing around with the board, so to speak, you don't accidentally fry your devices. However, from experience, these STs are pretty resilient. So for example, for simple test boards like this, it's absolutely fine, but I wouldn't recommend this on connectors, for example, on a commercial product. One particular note we should take care of, however, is this N reset pin. So let's look at the data sheet. So jumping to section 6.3.18, I just typed in reset in my search tool to scan through the PDF of this STM32 datasheet. We can see the characteristics. We can see the input high and input low levels, as well as the recommended external circuitry in figure 28 for the N reset pin. We can see that internally to the microcontroller in the box on the right hand side, we have an internal pull up. And from the table above, this pull-up resistance is approximately typically about 40 kilo ohms, but can range anywhere from 25 to 55 kilo ohms. So this is nice. By default, we actually don't have to connect this end reset pin because it's internally pulled up and immediately on boot, without an external connection, this microcontroller would simply start booting up, so to speak. However, they do recommend an external reset circuit, so a filtering capacitor, or debouncing capacitor, and a switch. Now, I found that typically I don't need a switch on an N reset because I'm doing the switching via the debugger we've connected anyway, but I typically do place a capacitor, this 100 nanofarad capacitor on the N reset line. And we don't need an external pull up because that's already in the device. So from that information, what we can do is just copy one of these capacitors. Now you can either place it at the TC2030 or your debug header or at the N reset pin. I'll just place it at the end reset pin, for example, like so, just to make clear we're coming from somewhere, some different part of the schematic, and that is from our tag connect header. And before we go into the pin, we have this effectively filtering capacitor that goes to the end reset line. Keep in mind, we're still gonna clean the schematic up after we're done, 
with adding all of the components in. So we'll draw brand new boxes, we'll fill in the title blocks and so on. So do keep that in mind that this is still a work in progress. But now we have our serial wire debug, our main programming interface in place as well. Now that we have the serial wire debug header in place, as well as the connections to that header, there's one thing we still have to remember to implement. Unfortunately, this isn't entirely clear just from the schematic symbol. If you remember back, for example, looking at stm 32 cube IDE, on pin four, PH3, this is an alternate function pin that also has boot zero on that pin. So again, boot zero, if we pull that low before startup, we are simply in run mode, very simply speaking. And if we pull this pin high before startup, then we toggle or trigger the bootloader internal to the STM32 microcontroller, and we can program this device by USB, UART, and so on. And we definitely want to make this toggleable because it could of course be that you don't always have a ST-Link or debugger with you, and you want to program it via USB. This pin PH3 is kind of hidden in the schematic symbol, and we can see it here, PH3 pin four. So this we want to root out. So again, we just take a wire, and we root out past these symbols. We'll clean this up in just a second because we're going to be using this. So to make this a bit cleaner, I'm going to just click and drag and move these designators and these component values just to one side, just so we make it a tiny bit cleaner. So by default, we want PH3, which is our boot zero switch to be pulled low because we always just basically want to assume we want to be in run mode. That's the default most of the time. But in certain times you want to pull this pin high, we can do this via switch, we can do this by a button, or a different methodology, the easiest is usually just a switch or a button, that then pulls this pin PH3 to 3.3 volts, which is in our case, the core logic supply. So what we need then is a pull down resistor, so we press A and R to go to the resistor, and we can place it somewhere sensible in line with other components. Then we attach our wire to that resistor, and that other end of the resistor to ground, I'm just copying symbols, W as usual is our wire command. The value of this pull down resistor, we will determine in, in just a bit. It's not too critical, as long as it's a couple of kilo ohms, this could be five, 10, and even a bit larger than that is okay for this pull down. Another thing to mention is that this PH3 is not just a boot zero pin. If you go to cube IDE again, click on boot three, we can see it has many different options. We could do an analog input, uh, GPIO input, output, and so on. So after startup, once this boot zero pin has been sampled by the bootloader, we can actually use this, for example, as a typical input. So it could be a user input. And that's exactly what we then could use it for. So what I'd like to add is a button in this case, so just a tactile button, which then a user could interface with. So again, press A, then we can scroll down, for example, to switch. And under switch, there's many different types. We could put in a dip switch, for example, or any of these other switches, but what we want is a switch underscore push. So just a tactile push button switch, click OK, and we can add that somewhere to the design, for example. Now, if we were just to wire this up like so, one side of the switch goes to the boot zero pin, so pin PH3, and the other side, we can just copy one of these 3.3 volt flags, goes to the other side of the switch. So like this, before we plug in power to this device, we could hold down the switch push button. This would pull pin PH3 high, and after it's booted up, we release the push button and we are in the bootloader mode. If we don't push this push button, this push button is normally open, so there's no connection. It's like an open circuit, and therefore R1 is pulling pin PH3 low. Because we'd also like to use this switch as a user button, so after boot up, assuming we don't go into the bootloader, it's typically important to also provide some form of debouncing, and that's usually very simple, just an RC low pass filter in the simplest case. So we can copy one of these 100 nanofarad capacitors, place that in parallel with R1, or this resistor, pull down resistor at the moment, copy the resistor, rotate it, and we want to place that in series, for example, like so. And we'll determine the values at a slightly later stage, and the reason for determining the values later, we will see in just a bit as well. In this way, we have now a very, very crude debouncing circuit, essentially a low pass filter, formed by R2, R1, and C12, and C17, feeding into PH3. Let's not forget our net labels, so I'll just copy a net label and then change the name, and I'll just call this, for example, boot zero. So we've come quite far already. This is the main external circuitry we need to get this device up and running. However, of course, there's some things missing. We don't have a power source. We would like to maybe add some peripherals, because as it is, we don't really have anything interesting except maybe a button and a Bluetooth connection. So of course you want to add some uh, peripherals and that depends on the scenario you're in. So if you're maybe creating your own smartwatch or whatever device you're creating, you will need to choose different peripherals. And this is where, again, these pins, these general functions, so to speak, pins, for example, bank PA and bank PB, and these pins come in. 
But now we have essentially the essential circuitry in place that forms the basis of what you need as a minimum supporting circuitry for this particular MCU. For the sake of simplicity and time in this video, I will be just showing you how to select peripherals and how to route them out, for example, to connectors. We'll be using Cube IDE to do this, but of course you could go the datasheet route as well. So Cube IDE, we can on the left hand side see what peripherals are available to us quite quickly. For example, we have an SPI available, UART, USB, I squared C's and so on. And this is, for example, where I could select whatever interface I want. For example, UART, I can select an asynchronous UART, and this automatically then maps pins that are suitable and don't interfere with the other selections we've made previously. So here, PA9 and PA10. Again, control click to map pins to other locations in case these don't suit you. To start off with, what I'd like to do is add a USB connection in. So on the left-hand side, under connectivity, USB, we had device selected, and this maps to pins PA11 as the differential pair negative side and PA12 differential pair positive side. And again, control clicking, we can't move these pins so these are in a fixed location. We can use the USB to, for example, stream data. It could be an audio device class. And of course, we can use it to program the device as well. And you can find pre-written drivers, so to speak, under middleware and software packs, and then USB device. And there's many different classes that ST provides already which you can use pretty much straight away. For us now, just doing the hardware design, what's important is that we have PA11 and PA12 selected. So we have PA11 was D minus, PA12 was D plus. So just to indicate, we will draw some wires out and we can really give these net labels. So I'll give USB underscore D minus for PA11 and I'll give a net label USB underscore D plus. It's important that we end in minus and plus and that otherwise the net name is the same. So USB underscore D, then we have a minus and USB underscore D, and then we have a plus. This is important because this signifies to KiCad, our software, that this or these two parts, these two nets form a differential pair. And we'll see that later what that is when it comes to PCB routing, that these traces then on the PCB are routed differentially. So they're routed as a differential pair, they're routed together but more on that later. But it's important that we give them the correct net names. Then for this, we of course want to connect this to a USB connector. Now there are many different types of USB connector, of course. What's typical these days are USB type C connectors, which I'm sure you're familiar with. We can plug this in in two orientations, rotated by 180 degrees, and they're better user friendly and a pretty good connector. So that's what we'd like to use in our design. The way we can add connectors is as usual, we press A, let's type in USB, and then we can see under the connector list that we have USB A, B, B micro, mini, and so on, but of course USB C as well. Now, USB C as well comes in many different flavors. We have USB C that is, for example, super speed capable, USB that might just have power only, but then what we actually want for this design is a USB C receptacle that has power and ground as well as some other configuration pins, but also we only need USB 2.0 for our USB full speed SCM32. So, this is the receptacle we'll select and place it on the schematic. The USB-C receptacle in this case, keep in mind the pins are mirrored. There are duplicates of these pins on the actual connector itself, and we'll see that in the PCB design. So we actually have two VBUS pins, we have two ground pins, and here we have sideband use one and two, duplicated differential pairs, duplicated communication channel pins. Although the STM32 contains a bit of ESD protection on most of its I.O., and you can read that up on the datasheet, of course, it pays off, especially in connectors that are used a lot of the time, or pretty much any connector that's exposed, so to speak, to the real world, to add in ESD protection that sits then close to the connector. So other than just this USB-C receptacle, I'd like to add in some ESD protection. The one we're using is very common and it's also by ST Microelectronics. And this is a kind of do it all package. The six pin package called USB LCC 6 2SC6. In an easy to solder SOT23 package, it has protection for VBUS as well as the differential data lines and also has a fairly low capacitance. So this part could also be used, for example, for high speed USB high speed. This symbol is in fact available in the KiCad libraries. But if you see on the right hand side the arrangement of the KiCad library pinout, Pins 1s and 6 are tied together as they should be, 3 and 4 are internally tied together. But actually placing this on the schematic and then routing this out is going to create a mess of the schematic. So I copied the symbol and rearranged the pinout to make this much easier to connect up. So this is what we'll use. It's an identical copy, except I've just moved some pins around. So I'll select that from the library and place this on the schematic. 
Unfortunately, also the keycat symbol for this connector isn't great. I'm not sure why the CC pins up here. They'd be much better suited below the differential data pair because we have to put some pull down resistors on this connector. In any case, we can wire up the differential pair connections like so. We route out the differential pair minus from the connector and the differential pair plus from the connector right into the pins one and three of the ESD protection device. Given that the USB-C connector and receptacle, they're reversible, so 180 degrees we can plug in, in our cable. That's why we have a pair of D minuses and pair of D pluses. For higher speed systems, you shouldn't do this, but since we're only running USB full speed, so comparatively very, very slow, and a low data rate, we can just simply connect up D minus and D plus right at the connector. Then on the other side, we have pin six is D minus, Pin 6 D- route into PA11 of the MCU, and pin 4 of the ESD protection device routes into USB D+, which is PA12, as we saw from Cube IDE. The ground connection, pin 2 of the ESD protection device, of course, needs to hook up to ground, and power, not to 3.3 volts, which is pin 5, but rather to V bus, which is the power coming from the USB Type-C connector. We will actually then, of course, be using VBus to power the rest of the device, and for which we have to add in a regulator, but we'll do that in just a bit. We also have these sideband use, so SBU and CC communication channel pins that we need to hook up somehow. It turns out, actually, that we don't need to hook up the SBU pins anywhere, and for that, just to indicate that we've looked at them and that we don't get an electrical rules check error later on, on the right-hand side, or by pressing Q, we can add a no connection flag and place those on the sideband use pins and then press escape to cancel and then these won't appear as errors because they're left floating. We do however have to hook up the CC1 and CC2 communication channel pins. If this is hooked up to for example a USB-C port on a host then having the CC pins floating will not indicate to the host that a power syncing device is connected. We can indicate to a host that a power syncing device is connected by using 5.1 kilo ohm pull down resistors per CC line. So I'll take the resistor we had over here, place one like so and one like so, and then a route to the CC1 as well as to the CC2 pins. The other side of these resistors then needs to be connected to ground like so. And the value of these resistances is 5.1 kilo ohms per piece. Let's not forget the shield and ground pins. And according to the type C USB specification, we need to tie both shield and ground to our system ground. So for example, connected like so. Let's not forget to add net labels. So these CC pull down resistors have to be 5.1 kilo ohms with a 1% tolerance. Therefore, we will use the same 5.1 kilo ohms also for this pull down resistor at the boot zero pin. This is known as bill of materials or bomb consolidation, making sure we don't have very many different unique parts or unique entries on the bill of materials. So we could of course use a 10 kilo ohm resistor here, but why should we? Boot zero doesn't require specific resistor value, only in the order of a couple of kilo ohms. So we just reuse parts we already have in the design, for example, from the USB type C connector. For this series resistor, which is part of this debouncing network, a couple hundred ohms or less is usually sufficient. Keep in mind R2 and R1 form a voltage divider, so if we chose, for example, R2 to be 5.1 kilo ohms, R3.3 volts, when this button is pressed, will be divided by 2. So we want to keep this resistance quite a lot smaller than this pull-down resistance. So let's just start off with 100 ohms, and of course when you have the PCB in your hand, you can change the value depending on circuit performance. Before we choose some peripherals to end up on these PA and PB pins, let's just complete the USB-C section, which is also our power source, with a power regulator that generates our 3.3 volts. Now for this USB-C, with these pull-down resistors of 5.1 kilo ohms, we can expect VBUS to be in the range of 4.5 to 5.5 volts, with a nominal voltage of 5 volts, and in certain cases this will be able to supply up to 1.5 amps, which is far, far more than we need for this design. We need significantly lower current. This 5 volts, which will be apparent nominally at VBUS, needs to be stepped down somehow, so converted to a 3.3 volt voltage that we can then use for the microcontroller and peripherals. There's usually two different options of doing this. One would be, for example, a step down and a switching converter which requires quite a number of different parts. We need to calculate various values, but they are rather efficient if you choose the parts correctly. A far easier version and something that's more suitable for this type of video, tries to show a whole design in one video, is to go with a linear load dropout regulator. 
Low dropout regulators or LDO voltage regulators are very, very common. They're typically fairly inexpensive. You can get them with lower noise. They're used also in analog circuits if you're sensitive to power supply noise. But in our case, we don't require much current and we have a five volt input and a 3.3 volt output. So the input output voltage differential isn't too large. Therefore, the power wasted in one of these linear regulators isn't too large. For example, the power wasted would only waste, let's say, about 0.2 watts of power, which is okay in this application, and it allows us to use a much simpler, simpler part. To find a suitable voltage regulator, we need to know what currents we might expect. And this is where QBIDE can help us again. If we go to Tools on the top right-hand side, on the left side we select PCC, we can let QBIDE calculate the current requirements based on what peripherals we've selected. So if I double click on one of these run steps, we can choose the power mode, power range, what our supply voltage rail is, what CPU frequency we're running at, various other configurations, and also what pinout we would want. We can calculate a worst case by just clicking in and enable all IPs, and we already see our step current consumption is about 16 to 17 milliamps. And this is of course, just for the microcontroller. We could of course also just go the datasheet route. We also of course have to add in the peripherals we use. So if we're using various sensors or if we're toggling relays and so on, that would of course add into the equation. But you can already see as we'll probably just be adding some connectors, for example, to UART and I squared C on this very simple demonstration board, our current consumption requirements are very, very low indeed. And that's again why one of these LDO regulators does make sense. So if you go to your preferred component distributor, look for LDO voltage regulators, select in stock. We want SMD type. We want one output, which is positive and an output current. Something around 150 milliamps is probably okay. Remember, we want to keep in some margin as well. We can click apply filters. We have more filters here. We want to, of course, allow an input voltage that is higher than our maximum expected input voltage. And for our USB-C receptacle, that's maximum 5.5 volts. So let's say we can choose other options here, such as package types, quiescent currents, input voltages, minimums, and so on. What I'd like to choose is a fixed output type. So one that doesn't require external feedback network to set the output voltage. And I want the output voltage to be fixed at 3.3 volts and click apply. Then we can sort by price because this is a fairly low cost board. We don't have very particular requirements and we see a list of regulators that could be suitable. So there's many different package types. For example, this one here looks like it might be harder to solder. One of these exposed lead package types might be easier and so on. The part I ended up finding, which is fairly suitable, is this MIC5365 by Microchip. It's readily available at the time making this video, pretty inexpensive. Comes in an easy to solder SOT23 package. Output voltage is fixed at 3.3 volts, so we don't need an output feedback network. Output current sufficiently sized at 150 milliamps, fairly low quiescent current, and input voltage range. 5.5 volts is the upper limit of what we expect, and that is pretty much fine. In KiCad then, Another reason for choosing this part was that this symbol is actually already available. So if I look for MIC5365, we want the dash 3.3YD version, which is in the SOT23-5 package. Click OK and add this to the design. Going back, looking at the datasheet, another reason for choosing this device is that in the datasheet, it says it's stable with one microfarad ceramic output capacitors. Typically, LDO regulators will require an input and an output capacitor, and sometimes, especially older regulators, will require, for example, higher ESR output capacitors, such as tantalum or even an aluminium electrolytic, to preserve stability of the regulator. Therefore, these more modern LDOs are nice because they only need fairly small ceramic capacitors for stability. This is great in our design because we already have capacitors, for example, this 4.7 microfarad capacitor, that we could then use as input and output capacitors. So the way we then just need to hook this up is take our output from VBUS, so after the ESD protection, so to speak, route that to the input of our regulator, and the input of the regulator needs a capacitor, so I can move this to the side, which we hook up to the in, and the output of this regulator needs a capacitor, which we hook up to the V out pin. Then of course we have the ground pin, so we just copy a ground symbol, and we hook up the grounds also to our capacitors, for example, like so. The output voltage, because this is a fixed voltage regulator, is simply 3.3 volts, and then we can just place our 3.3 volts at the output here. The enable signal, we need to see in the datasheet what we need to do with that. So if I just look for enable, we see enable input, it's active high, high is on, low is off, and do not leave floating, which is also very important. Then we also need to look at the suggested operating ratings. So enable voltage, 
is anywhere from zero volts to the input voltage. This means to turn this regulator on, we simply tie the enable voltage to the input voltage like so. And there we go. That's how easy it is to then supply power from five volts from my VBUS of the USB type C receptacle through the LDR regulator to 3.3 volts. Now we have a suitable power source for the rest of the circuitry on this board. We're nearing completion of the schematic now. There's of course a couple things we still should clean up and maybe create just as a demonstration, a connector or two where we assign some of the PA or PB pins to peripherals you might use in your own designs. We're still missing a power flag, for example, on the VBUS line right here, which is nominally at five volts. So on the right hand side, all by pressing P, we can look for plus VBUS. We can choose, for example, the plus five volt flag and put that at the USB connector just so we're clear what the nominal voltage is on that VBUS line. Other than that, we could of course add some status or indicator LEDs. This could be an LED, for example, on the 3.3 volt rail to indicate that power is on, or just an LED, which we can then toggle via the microcontroller, which is usually my preferred option because you have more control over that, of course. To select peripherals, we go to Cube IDE again, and again, this is very, very generic. It depends on what you're connecting to. So if you're connecting to an SBI sensor, or maybe an I2C display, or you need timer channels, this is the area where you would do this. So we already have some fixed pins, which in this case can't change, but all of these grayish pins, all of these light gray pins, we can select what peripherals we would like. So on the left-hand side, if we want an I2C, again, Let's just enable I squared C, control click to move that wherever you want it to. So it looks like PA9 could be a choice and I squared C SDA or I squared C3 might give you different options and so on. For now, I'm just going to enable one UART. Again, this is just as a demonstration. You can choose whatever peripherals you want. I chose UART1 and it's placed it in an area where there aren't too many other pins. And for us, this is good because we don't have cramped routing. So I wouldn't want to have these pins, for example, PB5 and PB4, because we have a few other connections coming out there as well. So let's just stick with PA2, PA3 for now. Again, just a demonstration. So PA2 is UART1TX. So we can route out a tiny segment and PA3 was our other pin. And again, just adding net labels like so, just to immediately be clear what these pins do and what these pins are. Then we would like to hook this up to some form of connector. So again, we can press A and look at the connector section. These could be generic connectors, or if you have a specific connector already in mind, you can choose that here, of course, as well, or of course, create your own schematic symbols. I'm just gonna go with a very generic one by four header, place it somewhere on the schematic like so, and we'll choose what exact connector this will be later on when we come to the footprints. Typically, we would like to supply, for example, power and ground as well. So I'm gonna take a 3.3 volts, and a ground. Now, of course, we could just route up UART-TX, UART-RX like so to the connector, but typically it's good practice to also add ESD protection, as well as I also add in some current limiting resistors. So I'll just copy the 100 ohm resistor we have here and place it both on the UART-TX and UART-RX line. This also can help with the ESD susceptibility of your device. So this, these two series resistors like so, and we won't add ESD protection for the sake of time, and typically I would also add, for example, a small bypass or decoupling capacitor between 3.3 volts at ground at any connector power pin. But for now, we'll just leave it as simple as this. And of course, don't forget your net names. I'll just call them TXC, so TX connector and RX connector. Of course, you could flip those names because this is effectively the, the RX of the connector and pin three is the TX of the connector. Depends on what your naming conventions usually are. But for the sake of simplicity, we'll leave it at this for now. Other than, of course, for example, a UART connection, let's just add an LED. And typically I like to add my LEDs on timer channels because via timer channels in the STM32 microcontroller, I can set a PWM wave as the output with a certain duty cycle and thus I can vary the brightness of my LED. There are various different timer channels available in this particular microcontroller. Let's just click on a random pin. So PA7 looks like we have timer 17 channel one. So if I select that, on the left-hand side, timers, activate it, and set channel one to PWM generation channel one. And this, of course, now might not matter very much because we're not doing the firmware, but it matters because we need to check that the timers are suitable, for example, for generating PWM. There might be some timers that are capable and some that aren't. Of course, in most cases, PWM shouldn't be too difficult to configure, even if it's just a GPIO. But this point persists across any interface you might use, is check compatibility. But PA7 looks like it could be okay. 
So we can add an LED to pin PA7, which is pin 16. Press A, type in LED, and we get a generic LED symbol. Again, with a wire tool, hook up to PA7, but we do need a current limiting resistor. Depending on the color of this particular LED and other characteristics, a typical voltage or forward voltage of this LED might be somewhere from 1.8 volts or higher. And typically we want to run currents just about 1 to 10 milliamps, 10 milliamps already being very bright. Typically these types of LEDs are only run at about 1 to 2 milliamps. So knowing the forward voltage, knowing the current we want through it, we can calculate current limiting resistor, assuming of course full duty cycle. 100 ohms we would like to reuse, we don't want to add another different resistor to our design. The problem is 100 ohms is a bit too low, but what we could do is change all of the 100 ohms to 220 ohms, and then we're pretty much in range with the current requirements in the forward voltage drop of this diode. So let's do that. The way I can do that is in the top in KeyCard, click on Bulk Edit Fields, and then we can scroll to 100 ohms, and I'll just change that to 220 ohms, like so, click OK, and then we just copy one of these resistors down and connect up the LED and connect up ground to the other side. Calls have to make sure that the pin you connect the LED to can drive the LED, even though it's a very low current, there are some microcontrollers and some pins on microcontrollers that can't drive that much current, so not much more than maybe a couple of milliamps. So that's something you should double check as well. Then as usual, I always like to add LED labels, so I did LED underscore A for anode and LED underscore K for the cathode, or C if you prefer. But that pretty much sums up our schematic for this STM32 WB55 microcontroller. We have all of our bypass and decoupling capacitors, we have our power and ground hooked up, our high speed external and low speed external crystal oscillator, the switch mode power supply, the RF matching network, the filter and UFL connector, our boot zero, the tag connect, serial wire debug header, USB-C with ESD protection, our simple LDO regulator, and some peripherals we now know how to map out from Cube IDE. With this, we're pretty much done with the schematic, but I would like to show you some tips of how you could maybe clean this up just a tiny bit. It's fairly okay as it looks right now as a first pass, but there are some things I would like to add. As we did with, for example, this sideband use, these pins, we did these no ERC flags or do not, or not connected. So on the right hand side, again, add a no connection flag or press Q and place that on the unused pins. This is also a sanity check for us to see, okay, we've looked at these pins, we must have done some manual intervention to place these no connect flags on them. And this is what I do normally when I've gone through the schematic when I've checked it. If my schematic is more segmented and across multiple pages, I also like to draw, for example, bounding boxes around certain sections. This could be, for example, using the tool on the bottom right or pressing I, which is this add connected graphic lines tool. And then for example, I could draw bounding boxes around certain parts of the design, like so, add text or press T, and I could call this the 5 volt to 3.3 volt regulator, for example. Just so it's more clear, for example, to someone who reviews this schematic, if it isn't already clear enough, and just highlight certain aspects of the design. Or for example, why did we choose this 220 ohm resistor? What you could do is simply place a text field and then write down the calculation that we got 3.3 volts minus 1.8 volts forward voltage divided by 220 is about 7 milliamps. So we can place, for example, calculations, and this is something you, I would strongly suggest you do, placing calculations so you don't have to recheck, 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 go jump back to day sheets and so on, and that, that verifies just your thought process when you're creating the schematic. Of course, these are very, very basic examples, but it's something I would typically do. So as a very simple example, you could give your schematic page a title here with a simple single page schematic and every section I'll just quickly give a description of what it is and where we can quickly pick something out. So if you're discussing this with an engineer or a colleague, you can say, oh, the boot zero switch and okay, we can immediately jump to where that is. I just for myself find this very helpful. Also when I'm doing PCB design checks and so on. You will have also seen in the bottom right, we have a, what's known as a title block. And if we double click on this, we can change the parameters in the title block. So we could, for example, add in a date, which is always good, a revision, depending on your versioning system. You could say revision A or 1.0 or whatever, the title, company, and so on. So I'd strongly suggest you fill that in as well. And that would then add in, for example, these text fields. And this is always good practice, keeping track of revision dates, who the author was, and so on. But for now, this is pretty much the finished schematic. Next, we'll move on to actually picking footprints and components that match up. 
So we've only chosen, for example, values of these capacitors here, 100 nanofarads, but 100 nanofarad capacitors exist in many different packages and types and so on. Same for the resistors, connectors, and so forth. Of course, there's far more detail you can add and you should add to the schematic. So for example, what type of capacitors these are? Are these multi-layer ceramic capacitors? If so, what type are they? What voltage ratings are they? And so on. We'll go into a tiny bit of detail in this video, but of course that's a topic in its own right. We're now ready to choose footprints and the specific components themselves. As we saw from the schematic, we've only really entered values. Of course, we've chosen some parts specifically, such as the microcontroller or such as the ESD protection. But for example, for passive components, such as capacitors and resistors, we've just set a value and just put in a schematic symbol on our schematic. We need to create a link with a real component and a real footprint that ends up on the printed circuit board, which is then manufactured by the PCB manufacturer. Effectively, the PCB manufacturer sees next to nothing of the schematic, but will see what parts we've chosen and the footprints and the connectivity on the PCB itself. Now, there are many, many aspects that come into choosing the correct parts for your design, and that's something that takes quite a bit of practice to get right, so to speak. However, there are, of course, some simple guidelines, rules of thumbs to get started. I do have quite a lot of other videos on my channel that goes far deeper into hardware design than I can do with, with this tutorial. For example, video number 114 looks at capacitor hardware design basics, how you might choose ceramic capacitors, how to size them for DC derating, what types there are, how they age, temperature dependencies, and so on. And I do have very many hardware design focused videos on my channel. I'll leave a link to those playlists in the description box below, and please do check them out before we continue. Before we can assign footprints, however, we should get the annotation in order, because right now we've just taken the annotation which was given to us by KiCad every time we added it in a component. So for example, on the left hand side, J3, so J is typically a denotation for connector, starts at J3, and then we have J2 here, and on the right hand side we have J1 for our UFL connector. Similarly for resistors, we have R1 down here because we added it first, and then R2, and then the other resistors on this side. Same thing for capacitors and so on. We want to annotate our components in a logical order. That is typically from left to right, and depends top to bottom or section by section. So therefore, ideally you want USB-C receptacle to be J1, this tag connect header to be J2, and then maybe this yard header to be J3, and then the coaxial UFL connector to be J4. We can do this at the top in KiCad by pressing and fill in schematic symbol reference designators, clearing the annotation, and then we can change the order that these symbols are annotated in. So by X, Y, how we do the numbering and so on. So if I just go by this, so I change this to Y position and click annotate and close, we can see certain things have changed, but of course it depends on the center positions of all these connectors and components. So J1 being higher up than J3 gets annotated first, then J4. So not entirely what we wanted. So let's try that again and sort symbols by X, Y position, clear and annotate. This is a bit better. We have J1, J2, J3, J4, but then we have oddballs. For example, at the top, we have our LDR regulator. We have C1 and then C6. And this is why I typically manually or annotate my component designators. So I'll start with C1, double click on the reference C2, C3, C4, C5, and so on. And of course, this is a bit tedious, but it allows me to annotate exactly how I want to, because the tools in KiCad, for example, we only get to really have two options for the order, which usually aren't, in my eyes, sufficient. So I will re-annotate the schematic as I see fit, and I'll see you just in a second. After we've completed the schematic annotation, we need to perform an electrical rules check. If we go to the top left, second button on the toolbar, edit schematic setup, we can see the electrical rules section, and this is what this electrical rule checker, or ERC for short, checks. So if pins are not connected, it'll show an error. If the input pin is not driven by an output pin, it'll be error, and we can change the severity by clicking on these radio buttons. We'll leave them as default for now and simply perform an ERC, so that we can do that here at the top right, perform electrical rules check, and run the ERC, and we get three violations and one ignored test. We're not using any SPICE models, so we can ignore this test. But we have three violations. If we click on one of them, we, if we can highlight what ERC is the problem, and it's saying that the input power pin is not driven by any output power pins. Well, this is a problem also due to this poorly designed symbol from the KiCad library. VLX SMPS is not just a power input, it's actually a power output, so that's okay. Secondly, this power input pin is not driven by any output power pins. 
and same thing for the ground as well. The way we can get rid of these ERC errors is by adding power flags. So go add power symbol or press P and scroll down to power underscore flag. And we will add this to the five volt net as well as to the ground net. Just with a wire connection like so, I will just get rid of the visibility, run the ERC again. And there we go. We now only have input power pin not driven by any output power pins, which was this VLX SMPS pin, pin 33, but we know that's just got to do with the symbol itself. Other than that, we don't have any errors. It looks like nothing's unconnected. We are okay to proceed. Now we are ready to assign footprints and components. To do so, we can, for example, go to the run footprint assignment tool in the top right toolbar, and all the yellow marked components don't have a footprint assigned yet. We have all these passive capacitors, we have inductors, resistors, and other components as well. When we click on, for example, C1 right at the top, which is a 4.7 microfarad capacitor, KiCad automatically jumps to the relevant part. So I can click on something else, for example, this 220 ohm resistor, and KiCad highlights this part for us. Component selection, again, is a very involved discipline and something we need to take care of on doing. If we, for example, click on the 100 nanofarad parts and then on the left hand side, choose the capacitor SMD library on the right side with the filtered footprints, we can see we have many, many different choices available. We have very, very small packages such as 201 packages and very large packages such as 1210 capacitor packages. What do we choose? And I'll just leave this here as a rough rule of thumb, rough guideline. Again, please refer to video number 114 for more detail, but we'll just quickly look at the component distributors. So now looking at Mouser, I've looked for 100 nanofarad MLCC, multi-layer ceramic capacitors, and filtered for in stock. We have various different options. We have dielectric type, we have a tolerance, a case code and imperial, case code metric, and a few other parameters. What's important for us mainly to start off with is the voltage rating. The voltage rating should be chosen to at least double the expected voltage, the DC voltage across the capacitor. In our design, the maximum voltage these capacitors will realize is 3.3 volts. And then we have this one capacitor, which will be exposed to five volts or 5.5 volts. So 100 nanofarad capacitors we choose with a DC voltage rating of at least 6.6 .6 volts. So we choose the nearest value, so that's at least 10 volts DC. Usually the higher the better, but of course there's a cost performance compromise. So higher voltage rated capacitors will typically cost more unless the capacitance is very small. Then tolerance. For these capacitors, we want a rough value. 100 nanofarads is okay, 80 nanofarads is okay, 120 nanofarads is okay. So any tolerance is okay, so I won't set any filter here. However, keep in mind that a 1% capacitor will be much more expensive than 20% rated capacitor. Dielectric, we want X7R or X5R in this case. This is to do with temperature dependence. In terms of case code, I typically go with imperial case codes. 0402 is typically suitable for a design like this, but you could even get away with using a larger 0603. To make things easy for us, we're gonna go with 0402 in this case, and then just click apply, and then we can sort by price. And then we have many, many different parts in stock. They start at about nine cents and quickly decrease in price. So something like a 25 volt rated 100 nanofarad capacitor, X7R0402, 10% tolerance. This part, for example, would be absolutely fine, but pretty much any other part we see here is fine as well. But let's just go with the cheapest one. So 0402, and that's what we then move over to KiCad. So all 100 nanofarad capacitors would be 0402 Imperial. So I can just select the footprints for all of those. Similarly for the resistors, here we simply have a voltage rating, a power dissipation rating, a size, a tolerance, and so on. We already saw that 5K1 resistors should be about a 1% tolerance for the USB-CC lines. No resistor in this design really needs to dissipate a lot of power. Therefore, for the sake of simplicity, let's just go with 0402 components for the resistors as well. So now we have all of our resistors set as our, our 0402 Imperial. Then we have, for example, these larger 4.7 microfarad capacitors. And again, remember we have one which is exposed to 5 volts. So we do a similar methodology going to our distributor and choosing a suitable package size. For this, something like 0805 is typically okay, and even 0603 is usually okay for this as well. So we'll go with 0603 for these larger capacitance capacitors. For these other very small capacitors, such as 0.8 picofarads and 0.3 picofarads, now these are very, very, very small values. So even the pad capacitances will probably be in the order of magnitudes of what we see here. So we will go with 0402 capacitors here, but keep in mind, going back to the application note for the STM32WB hardware design guide, we are given component values for these capacitors and these inductors. 
Now, we can see here, looking at them, these are in fact not recommended for new designs, but we can still get them at the time of making this video. But of course, we can go with alternatives for the sake of simplicity. Now we'll just go with these and we can see these are 0402 and the dielectric is COG. So all of these capacitors here, we just go with 0402, 0402, and these two capacitors, which are still undefined value because we haven't chosen a crystal yet, will make 0402 as well. We have an LED here. For the sake of keeping the sizes similar, of course we can go with a larger one. Depends if you're hand soldering this or not. I would probably not hand solder this. So I'll just go with the LED. So selecting footprint library on the left and then selecting LED with 0402. For the inductors such as L1, L2, remembering back to the data sheet, section 3.7.1, we actually have recommended component values for L1, as well as for that smaller 10 nano Henry inductor, which happens to be this Murata part number which in turn happens to be an 0402 inductor. So in the footprint assignment tool, L1 needs to be an inductor SMD and 0402. The 10 microhenry inductor, again given in the data sheet, should be an 0805 type. But keep in mind this is end of life, so we might have to find an alternative part, but we can still go with the same footprint as there are many different alternatives for this. So 10 microhenry, 0805, the 2.7 nanohenry inductor for the RF filter network will be 0402 as well. Then we come into the slightly more complicated part of figuring out what connectors we want, what push buttons and what crystals. USB type C receptacles, I will just go with what keycat has available. So I'll go to connector underscore USB. So I can choose one of these connectors on the right hand side. So for the sake of simplicity, I'm just gonna go with this GCT USB 4105 footprint. And we can preview the footprint by clicking on the view selected footprint button. And we can also view 3D model by clicking on the view 3D model button and this is the USB connector we will be going with. So double click on that. Then we have our header and for this we can just go with any header of your choice. It could be a 2.54 millimeter pitch header, a Molex, JST, whatever you want. We can filter by pin count by clicking the bottom with a hash on it and this then only shows us connectors which have the same amount of pins as our, sim as our symbol on the schematic. I'm quite a fan of these Pico blade connectors, so I'll just go with one of these just for the sake of time. For our coaxial connector, we want to select our UFL connector. So I'm going to go to on the left hand side connector coaxial, and we'll just go with one of these UFL connectors from High Rose. For push buttons, I'm just going to go with a random push button, for example, this one here. And then we come finally to selecting our crystals. For the crystals, the safest bet to know what's compatible, we will just go via the reference design again. And we have some little descriptions here. So for example, for the 32 meg crystal, it's NX2016, 32M. And for the 32.768 kilohertz crystal, it's NX2012. Looking for those part numbers, we arrive, for example, at Mauser at this particular crystal. And this has a case size of two by 1.6 millimeters and load capacitance of 10 picofarads tolerance of 10 parts per million and a frequency of 32 megahertz, which is in spec of what the datasheet wants. And for the 32.768 kilohertz crystal, it's a 2 by 1.2 millimeter package with a load capacitance of 12.5 picofarads. And because we're using the same crystal here and we can approximate the same stray and load capacitances, we will go with also 10 picofarads for C15 and C16, which we then map over to our own schematic. But before that, 32 megahertz was two by 1.6 millimeters. So going to KeyCAD, assign footprints. With 32 megahertz, we want an SMD crystal. So on the crystal, crystal SMD, two by 1.6 millimeters. So we select that. And for the 32.768 kilohertz crystal, we go with a two by 1.2 millimeter package. So two by 1.2, select that. Apply, save schematic and continue. And we've assigned all of the components. Now remembering that these capacitors should be 10 picofarads we can change these values to be 10 each. And again, this is because we're using the same crystal as they are in the reference design and the same IC. So now we have all of our components annotated. We've checked the schematic. Of course, you should do further checks, make sure that the pinout is correct, make sure the current consumptions are correct and so on. But for now, we'll assume this is all correct, but I'd strongly suggest doing very thorough checks of your schematic before moving on to PCB design. What we're going to be doing next is something you could also do after the PCB design stage. But we selected footprints for all of these schematic symbols. What I'd like to also add is, for example, the manufacturer, manufacturer part number, distributor link. And this will be useful when we're getting our board assembled and manufactured because we'll need to produce a bill of materials. To do this, we go to the top in the schematic editor 
and click bulk edit fields of all symbols in schematic. And we are presented with this table here. We have our reference designators, which are grouped by value, with the value, footprint, and quantity. We can, of course, add other fields. So I'll add a field and we'll call this manufacturer. Another field, which we'll call manufacturer part number and another field called distributor link. For all of these parts, we then need to find the suitable manufacturer, manufacturer part number and distributor link. And then later on, you can see in the bottom button, we can export this as a CSV. So for example, for our crystals, the 32.768 kilohertz crystal, I would go to Mouser, I would copy the manufacturer part number, the manufacturer is NDK, and the distributor link is this Mouser link, for example, or whatever your preferred distributor is, and pop it in like so. And this is what we do for all of the remaining parts, for all the inductors, capacitors, resistor, and everything that's in here. Again, this might be just a quirk of KiCad or how the libraries are designed. Typically, this information, so manufacturer, manufacturer part number, distributor link, and so on, should be part of the library and unique to every single component. But this is just the way KiCad is organized, unfortunately. But ideally, it should be part of the library to also list distributor link, datasheet, manufacturer part number, and so on. So I'll just fill this in by myself and we'll see this again later. I've now filled in the manufacturer, manufacturer part number and distributor link fields for all of the components in the symbol fields table. This is again choosing suitable components. So for example, for the resistors, I have a preferred brand and I know their part numbers quite well. And that's why I would just go with them or with the inductors. We chose them based on the recommended guidelines. The connectors, again, this is from previous experience. I don't expect someone who's just started, of course, to know which parts to pick right away. And this takes time, takes progress and progress. But this could be, for example, a starting point for parts you might want to use in your own design. You will have also seen J3, which is our tag connect header, also ends up in the symbol fields table. And that's to be expected because this is not the bill of materials which we'll export later. But if we double click on this connector, we can actually see the checkbox is marked for exclude from bill of materials. And that's exactly what we want. The tag connect footprint is only for these pads and these through holes. So it's not actually a component and that's why it should be excluded from the bill of materials. What I'd like to do before we move over to PCB design is add some net classes that might help us when we come to the PCB design stage. The way we can do that is at the top left, click on edit, edit schematic setup, and then project net classes. I'll add another net class and we'll call this RF, another net class, for example, USB, net class power, net class ground, and net class zero wire debug SWD for short. What we can then do is below in the net class assignments, add a pattern, and say, if the pattern, for example, is local, so forward slash RF, and the forward slash meaning local, RF, and star, we can see on the right-hand side, the filter automatically finds all of the nets that are compatible. Then we can assign all of those nets to a net class, for example, RF. We can do the same thing for USB, so slash USB star is assigned to USB, and so on. This becomes quite useful because then we can set up, for example, custom design rules for those net classes. We can assign custom colors in the PCB editor, which makes our PCB design life a tiny bit easier and nicer. And like so, we've added in all of our nets, for example, for the power nets. That's why we started them all with a plus, because when we can do the plus star pattern and assign those nets, which are automatically detected as plus 3.3 volts and plus 5 volts as power. So we can save that and click OK. And now we have net classes for all of these. Thank you very much for watching part one of this two part series of videos. We've now finished the main project creation and schematic part of this design. And in the next video which will be released in exactly one week time. And by the time you're probably watching this video, it's probably been released. A link will be in the description box below, as well as in the first pinned comment. Please make sure to check that out and follow along with the PCB design. Thank you again for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.